Jura, Mia and Bag were similarly in a state of shock as they looked down at themselves. Each gazed upon her armor, which had once been her dread. To them, it didn't feel as if they were wearing suits, rather the armor was like a second skin. There was no sensation of being enveloped within a shell. And the power, oh the power that was now coursing through their very beings. Is this what Slade felt every time he transformed? It made them feel as if they could take on anything the universe could throw at them. At that moment, Lance shook himself out of his shock and attacked. Tekken they may be, but they were newly formed and vulnerable. He had the opportunity to destroy them before they could become a threat. Without a second thought, he launched a barrage from his shoulder guns at the nearest foe, which was Tekamondida. However, at the same time, another Tekamon reacted, namely Blaster. G.I.D.A. Look out! Slade caught sight of Lance as he fired off his energy projectiles. Without hesitation, he sped toward her and managed to get between the shots and their target. The blasts impacted hard against his chest, causing a massive explosion and enveloped him, obscuring him from sight. Lance smirked from behind his helmet. He didn't hit Dina, but at least he destroyed the so-called evolved Tekamon. Ha! What a joke! He couldn't even withstand his weaker weapons, much less his. Suddenly, a shadow shot out from the explosion and slammed hard into Lance. The egotistical Tekamon felt a hand begin to crush his throat despite the protection of his armor. His eyes bugged out as he saw an enraged jolt crushing the life out of him as Blaster drove him back. The two plowed into one of the walls of the computer chamber and kept on going. I'm getting a huge energy reading from the center of the Earth ship and it's Misty never got to finish as something blasted out from the hull of the enemy vessel like a nuclear missile being launched from its silo. The scanners zeroed in on the object and the bridge crew were surprised to see two Tekken grappling with each other. They were even more surprised to see Tekken blaster once again. Lance was losing consciousness as his opponent continued to apply his vice-like grip on Lance's windpipe. The strength that Slade was exerting was unbelievable as Lance's armor was buckling under the strain. In desperation, he used his feet to kick out at Slade's chest. This caught Slade by surprise as Lance took the opportunity to let loose with his greatest weapon. W-H-A-B-O-O-O-M. Slade was driven backward as he was again enveloped in an explosion, but this time it was a hundred times more intense. The blast continued to expand among the background of cube fighters, seed ships, Dreads and vanguards as they fought each other. Lance chuckled as he scoffed at the apparent demise of his foe. Ha! Evolved or not, even you can't take a Voltic at point blank range. He continued to laugh for about another two seconds. Then he saw something coming out of that explosion. No. Slade was royally ticked off. Before the main Tekamon could even blink the evolved Tekamon was darting around him like a maddened dragonfly and commenced to pick him apart. Inside the Earth Mothership, the other two Tekamon of the Harvesters were mixing it up with the three former Dread Pilots. Unfortunately for Jura, 
Tide and Mia, their enemies had more experience with their Takamon abilities than they did. One good thing was that the Nirvana clone was not attacking as the virus was starting to take effect. However, Whoa! I can't stop! Tide cried out as she flew about haphazardly around the chamber. She had no idea of how much more powerful her armor's propulsion units were, in comparison to her old spacesuit's maneuvering thrusters. It was like having her dreads engines mounted on her back, which in a sense they were. The cybernetic control systems were unknown to her and even the slightest thought would send her careening in another direction. She was so used to sitting in a nice, safe cockpit and operating a control panel in front of her, that she was at a total loss when it came to flying on her own. In a way, her erratic flight pattern had a benefit as the remaining Tachydred copies couldn't get a beat on her. She dodged each and every shot, and in a few cases, the enemy ended up firing at each other. However, Tide panicked as she found herself charging headfirst toward a copy of Tachydred Jura. The Mecha raised its barrier and the red hat held up her arms in front of her and braced for the worst. W-H-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-
The deadly crescent-shaped blasts cut through anything they collided with and the chamber became littered with vicious gashes. Mia was uncertain if her new armor could withstand a hit, and she wasn't willing to find out. Axe chuckled as he continued to pursue and press the attack. Oh, Mia had become a Tekamon. She was a mere novice and couldn't possibly stand up to someone with far more experience. He could sense the fear in her, as he chased her like a wolf going after a rabbit. He even began taunting her as swung his axe again and again. Oh, what's your hurry, little rabbit? The fun has just started. Surely you can't be afraid of me. Mia growled as she continued to dodge. She knew that he was just toying with her. She wanted dearly to shut up his snide remarks, but she didn't know how to fight back. Running was her only option and she hated it. Damn it. If only I had a weapon. Slade's got one when he transforms, so where the hell is mine? Do I even have one? Jura was also having difficulties, as she was engaged in battle with the Harvester's female fighter. So far, it had been basic hand-to-hand, but Rapier had the advantage and was kicking Jura around like a soccer ball. She winced as her opponent slammed a roundhouse kick to her head then followed through with a straight kick to the abdomen, driving Jura back. The blonde began wishing she had gone to more of Slade's self-defense classes, and vowed that if she got out of this alive, she would attend each session and train more with the warrior squadron. How did such a weakling like you become a Tekamon? Rapier scuffed as another one of her kicks landed and drove Jura down toward the chamber's floor. Powers such as ours should only be reserved for those who truly deserve it. Shut up, you. Hey, RGH. Jura was stopped in mid-sentence as her punch was intercepted and Rapier delivered a blow to her temple causing her to become disoriented. Before she knew it, Jura was bodily thrown down toward the chamber floor. The former dread pilot just barely managed to get her thrusters going and stopped just inches before slamming into the surface. Pulling on an extra burst of speed, she rocketed back up toward her foe. However, Rapier simply swerved out of the way, and Jura overshot her target. She couldn't stop herself in time and impacted hard against a chamber wall, causing a deep depression. Before she could recover, Rapier came up from behind and grabbed a fistful of the blonde's hair. She then began to repeatedly pound Jura's helmeted head into the wall with utter brutality. Dida cried out as the last of the Tekadred clones converged on her. She still hadn't gotten the hang of controlling her armor's thrusters and the enemy wasn't letting up for a second. She managed to take off again, but her flying still consisted of random zigzagging patterns. She knew that it was only a matter of time before they scored some hits and hoped that she could figure out what other powers she had before then. Above them, Barnett and the Tekabot with Puro riding inside it tried to assist, but they found themselves being blocked by the Nirvana clone. Apparently, it was fighting the effects of the virus and was still operating enough to be a hindrance. It couldn't use its anti voltiker but its lasers and particle cannons were still functional. At that point, 
as Dinah dodged another lethal barrage from her pursuers, she noticed some strange openings near the wrists of her gauntlets. She then remembered back to when she had seen Slade produce his tackle-ons. She decided to gamble and focused her thoughts toward the two openings. Sure enough, beams of light shot emerged and formed semi-solid energy shafts. She took hold of both beams and pulled. The beams solidified into twin, metal blades, but were slightly curved. With a short handle at one end, going by instinct alone, I merged the two pieces together at their hilts and they fused into one solid weapon that looked like a bow without the string. Feeling a subconscious surge from within, she turned to face her attackers, held up the weapon with her left hand and cocked back her right hand as if she were drawing back a bowstring. A shaft of energy appeared from her right hand to the front of the weapon, like an arrow. Tida aimed, released her right hand and the energy arrow. Missed her target. The redhead was exasperated as the projectile sailed past the head of a copy of her old tachydred. How could she have missed something that big? Rapier smiled as she continued to drive Jura's face into the chamber wall. It was only a matter of time before her head was crushed to a pulp. As she prepared to slam her head down again, a bright flare of light flashed from behind. Then, P-U-H-G-O-O-M. Rapier cried out in pain as Dinah's arrow struck between her shoulder blades, then ricocheted off in another direction. She lost her grip on her adversary's hair. It's time for some payback, you bitch. Jura snarled. Spinning about, she lashed out with her left arm. The triangular shield on her forearm impacted hard with Rapier's face and sent her sprawling. As she brought her arm forward in preparation to hit her again, the shield received a subconscious command and suddenly launched itself like a missile. This took both female fighters by surprise. But Rapier was the most affected as the shield crashed into her stomach and drove her down toward the chamber floor. She hit with a resounding crash and tore a deep trench into the metal. The shield then flew back toward its owner and reattached itself to Jura's forearm. The girl looked down at her arm with awe. Axe grinned as he had cornered his prey against another wall and was about to deliver the death blow. Mia winced as she prepared for the end, then noticed a flash of light heading toward them. As Axe raised his weapon above him, he too saw the light out of the corner of his helmet's visor. Before he had a chance to contemplate as to what it was, Tida's deflected arrow struck his wrists and exploded. This caused him to lose his grip on his axe and blinded him momentarily. Mia grabbed at her chance and put her thrusters on full throttle as she shot forward in a shoulder charge. Axe felt her impact hard against his chest and was driven backwards. He immediately wrapped his arms around her and began applying tremendous pressure. Mia cried out as she felt herself being compressed in his murderous bear hug. Her arms were pinned down at her sides and she was beginning to black out. Her hands reflexively opened up as she tried to push away. Everything was starting to go dark and she became dizzy. Then, as she was about to lose consciousness, her hands glowed as tiny openings appeared at her wrists and her subconscious gave a command to her armor. 
Directing her fists toward her opponent's abdomen, she concentrated and... Why The anime Takamon howled as something sharp and extremely painful pierced into his abdominal muscles, causing him to release his hold on Mia. As the nearest monopilot used her hands to push away from him, tiny slivers of light fired off from her gauntlets, causing more injury to her foe. At that point, Mia realized that she was able to fire tiny, but deadly armor-piecing energy darts. She began using her superior speed to circle about her opponent and fired at him, making Max feel more pain and rage. And as the battles continued, the virus within the mainframe continued to build. Okay, I can do this. Tina thought to herself as she tried for another shot. As the Tachydred clones bore down on her, she took aim with her bow, fired, and missed again. This time, her arrow flew past her target, bounced off a wall, and shot out the huge hole that the nearest on a clone it had made in the ship's hull. Now as to where it ended up. X I N P U. Look out. Yukio cried out as she saw that trio of cube fighters were about to open fire on her friend's vanguard. As she lined up her gun sight on the lead fighter, a streak of energy flew past her mecha and exploded on contact with the trio of enemy machines, causing them to be reduced to atoms. Thanks! The Amazon pilot said with gratitude. Yukio, however, was confused. But, I didn't even pull the trigger. Ray Deer let off a cry of outrage as she extricated herself from the chamber floor. That did it. There was no way she was going to lose to some blonde Takamon floozy. The kid gloves were off. Drawing forth her take sword. She shot up toward Jura, intent on cutting her to pieces. Barnett's friend barely managed to bring up her shield to block as Rapier's blade came down toward her head. She wished she had her own sword with her and show Rapier a thing or two about sword play. She had been the top fencing champion of her school back on Majli. However, her weapon had been destroyed along with her dread and transformation to Tekamon. All she had was her shield and her opponent wasn't letting up for her to launch it again. I want my sword. As she was forced back toward the wall by rapier's flashes and thrusts, her right hand brushed against her right hip and the nacelle that was mounted behind her glowed. A shaft of light extended itself from it, catching her attention as rapier swung toward her head. Acting instinctively, Jura reached for the light, grabbed hold of it and pulled. You're dead. Rapier screeched as the blade came down to cleave Jura in half. KDNG. Jura's eyes widened as she had just blocked Rapier's sword. With her own. In her hand was a single blade version of Slade's Tekalons, with a sectioned, triangular serrated edge. Then she smiled behind her helmet. The playing field had just been leveled. Mia struggled as she was pinned to the floor of the chamber. Standing above her was Axe, with his weapon raised high. The dread pilot cursed herself for being too careless and letting her foe get too close. Now it seemed that end was at hand as Axe prepared to decapitate her. 
he was already enraged that she had managed to inflict pain upon him and he was going to enjoy cutting off her head from her torso. He couldn't wait to see the look of horror on her face after he had extracted her severed head from its helmet. Out of desperation, Mia fired off her thrusters, just as the blade came swinging down toward her. This caused Dax to lose his balance and he toppled off his prey as she went shooting off across the floor. Mia didn't have time to turn as her back slammed into the main computer node. During the impact, her right hand brushed against a small opening near her hip. On cue, a beam of energy emerged and became solid in her hand. Mia shook her head to clear it and found that she was now holding onto something. The object was long and it had a very wicked looking tip at one end. A spear? At that point, Axe charged at her. Tyda cried out in frustration again as she missed again. She was so aggravated at not being able to hit anything with her new weapon that she just threw away the bow in anger. Now that act in itself would have been considered foolhardy, but in this case, it was the best thing to do, as Dida witnessed her a weapon suddenly speed off in a spiraling arc. The blade edges of the mouse sliced into the nearest tachydred copy, then through another and then another. The three machines exploded in an instant, after the bow turned boomerang cut them to pieces. Dida had a big sweat drop as she realized she had unintentionally downed three more of her enemies. Then she let off a yelp as her weapon came spinning back toward her. She raised out her hands to block and braced for impact. Katie. When she opened up her eyes, she saw that the bow was safely back in her left hand. Somehow, her hand had instinctively reached out and the bow honed in on it. Damn you. Rapier was not happy. She had been expecting to go up against only Slate and three Dread Pilots, not against three more Techmen. And though they were novices, they were actually holding their own, mostly due to dumb luck. And Juro was no slouch when it came to handling a sword. Juro was fighting hard as she parried and countered against each of Rapier's attacks. She was having some difficulty as she was unused to dueling in zero gravity and using her thrusters to maneuver. Furthermore, she was beginning to feel the negative side effects of becoming a Tekamon, namely the high energy requirements. She was tiring fast and she knew that she couldn't keep this up. She had to finish this off. As their blades clashed against each other, Jura began using all the skills she had learned in her fencing classes to force her opponent back, then knocked Rapier's weapon to one side long enough for her to point her left arm at her. Surprise! What the? Rapier was again repelled backward as Jura launched her shield into her face. Mia was on her knees as Axe was pushing down his blade toward her. The haft of her spear was the only thing that was keeping him from cutting her in twain. Though her strength had increased when she had become a Tekamon, she was no match against the brute power of Axe. As the blade slowly neared her head, she saw something plummeting toward them. Twisting her hands, she let off cry of desperation and fired off her darts. In his rage, Axe had forgotten about those weapons and received a face full of them. 
He let off cry of anguished pain as he staggered back. Mia took this chance to rear back with her spear, swung and W-H-A-G-O-O-M. Grand slam. Axe was sent rocketing upward as Rapier came plummeting downward. Both Tekkenmen collided in midair in a mighty crash. As their thrusters ignited to right themselves, a sudden disturbance came about the entire area. Lights began to flicker in random, erratic patterns as a certain something was finally taking effect. The massive Nirvana clone became even more sluggish and the remaining Tekadred copies suddenly stopped. Finally, even the walking behemoth became inert. The Nirvana. Captain. The virus is now taking effect. I'm getting reports of numerous shutdowns and malfunctions among the enemy forces, Misty announced happily. Outside, the Dreads and Vanguards were having a field day as their adversaries suddenly became immobile targets. At that point, Tecumon Blaster was finished with his duel, the ER Massacre of Lance. What is going on? Axe demanded as energy fluctuations and explosions began occurring all over the area. Rapier shook her head in confusion, but she knew that the dread pilots turned Tekken and it had something to do with it. When she got through with them, she was going to KBOOM. Both looked up to see something smash through the ceiling and before they could move, it collided with them and sent them all crashing to the chamber floor. A huge crater was formed as they hit like a meteor. At that point, the on a Tekumen, Barnett and Pegas regrouped above them and waited. Below, Axe and Rapier came to and were shot to see just lot or rather whom it had crashed into them. Lying on his back, his armor dented and badly cut up, was Lance. He was barely conscious and was in no condition to aid his comrades in any further battle. Then Slade appeared on the scene to finish this battle once and for all. Mr. Alien. Diana cried out happily as she saw him. However, her joy was short-lived as the main computer core of the Earth vessel was powering up again. Apparently, the machine had found a way to neutralize the virus. The Tekadred and Nirvana clones were also starting to stir to life again. Blaster knew what had to be done. All of you. Get out. Now. But why? Don't argue. Move. Slade then put out his arms horizontally in front of him and aimed for the main computer. Sections of his shoulder armor slid out to reveal massive energy collectors. His gauntlets also exposed smaller units as he began focusing his energy. If the computer couldn't be disabled, then it would have to be destroyed. All those present gasped as crackling black orbs of energy appeared and began to convalesce together. A massive power surge grew in strength as Barnett and the others took the hint. Jura and Mia had to drag Dinah away as they all headed out the opening that the Nirvana clone had made. On the floor of the chamber, Rapier and Axe staggered to their feet as they picked up their fallen comrade. Mustering up all the energy they could, they began making their escape. Captain, tell all ships to pull back. Barnett cried out as she raised the Nirvana on her communicator. What's going on? 
Magna demanded as she saw only Pegas and Barnets tread on her tactical displays. Then she saw the newcomers. Barnet, look out. You've got enemy tech men. No. They're ours. Ours? What do you? Never mind that now. Tell all ships to pull back. The virus didn't work. Slade's going to blow the Earth ship's main computer core. Slade gritted his teeth as his payload was primed and ready. The Nirvana clone was again activated and was powering up its anti volticker It was standing between him and the computer core. Too bad for it as Slade fired. Mega. G-O-L-D-E-K care. At the same time, the Nirvana copy launched a massive anti volticker The two beams collided heavily against each other, but Blaster's attack reflected back the clone's beam and kept on going. It plowed through the chest of the giant mecha, causing it to disintegrate into nothingness. Then it reached its real target. The computer node melted like butter as it was enveloped by the Megavolticker's energy. Shockwaves erupted all about the chamber, causing multiple explosions to occur. Whatever remaining Tachydred copies that were present were instantly annihilated, as the Earth mothership went into its death throes. Even its three techmen were engulfed in the conflagration as the ship shuddered by the force of hundreds of thousands of internal explosions occurring all at once. The destruction of the main system had started a chain reaction of unimaginable proportions. The Nirvana pirates all stared in awe as they watched the Earth mothership from a safe distance. Multitudes of bulges appeared all along the hull as it tried to contain the utter chaos that Slade's attack had caused. However, it was to no avail as the ship trembled one final time, then died in a horrific blast similar to that of a small supernova. As debris and energy pulses radiated all over the area, a small pinprick of light was seen speeding away from the blast at impossible velocity. As the scanners of the pirates zoomed in on the object, cheers of joy resonated throughout the crew as they saw the outline of Tecumon Blaster as he headed back to the Nirvana. There was a huge commotion on the main flight deck as squadrons of dreads and vanguards returned. However, the main attraction was the arrival of Slade, Jura, Mia and Dida. Everyone gathered around the Tekumen as they came in for a landing. The three girls were battered and their armor had sustained considerable damage but each had survived her trial by fire. However, as Tecumon Blaster landed before them, all eyes were turned toward him. Slade was barely able to keep down his feet as he spread his arms out and motioned for the other Tecumon to do the same. Focus. Down. Yourself and... His words trailed off as he triggered the process to return to his human form. The armor faded away to reveal an exhausted Slade. Naturally, he fell flat on his face. Duero immediately ran up to him and began assessing his condition. He nodded and gave the captain a thumbs up, indicating that Slade would be all right. Some crew members came out with a stretcher and immediately set the unconscious fighter on it. In a less than a minute, he was whisked away to the sick day. Mia, Tida and Jura began focusing their attention on themselves as they attempted to transform back. At first, it seemed that nothing was happening. 
But gradually, the armor began to fade away, leaving only flesh. Naked flesh at that. The girls found themselves clad in only their birthday suits and immediately tried to cover themselves up as they sank to their knees in utter exhaustion. Each clutched at her newest and most precious possession, a Tecate crystal. Earth. They failed. Those fools. They should have been able to destroy them with the power we gave to them. How could the Nirzana defeat our most powerful weapon and three Tekkenmen? They had four Tekkenmen. So what do we do now? The leader of the Earth Council let his colleagues bicker amongst themselves for a while longer, before calling them to attention. All eyes were set on their leader as he spoke. The problem of the Nirvana and its influence over the other worlds can no longer be tolerated. Our forces are encountering ever stiffer resistance from worlds that had been docile and compliant to our rule. Our very survival depends on the organs that are collected, but now we are faced with possible extinction. That end result is unacceptable, and it seems that to ensure our futures, then the final solution must be implemented. There was a collective gasp heard by the other members of the council. Expanding considerable resources to create the Tekkenmen and their special weapons was one thing, but that... Their leader was unshaken in his decision as he began in putting certain orders into his console. He then addressed the group again. It has been painfully obvious that we had not been using our Pixies to its full potential. Sending out underlings and drones to do the job it has brought us nothing but failure. We must take a personal hand in resolving our problems with that accursed vessel and its pixies. He paused for a moment as he contemplated the techman they had created and their end results. As far as he was concerned, they were expendable and weren't worth the effort of rescue. They were on their own and should they rebel, well, there was always those obedience chips. In any case, he had learned one thing. Never send a Tekamon to do a harvester's job. But leader, one of the council began. The head of the council silenced him with a glare. The decision has been made. The process shall begin immediately and we will finally put an end to the Nirvana. And Slade, deep within the bowels of Earth's mightiest space battleship, the Earth's Pixies had received the orders and glowed with trembling expectation. Everything was going according to plan. It was a plan that had been in the making for a very very long time. Now its patience would be rewarded as the leader of the Earth Council himself would take a part in its machinations. The Pixies began sending out subtle signals into space, contacting certain elements within the Harvester forces, informing them that the plan was about to be executed. The only thing that was missing was a host. The Nirvana, two days later, slid, after he finally come to from his ordeal as Tecumon Blaster, visited the sick day where Dida, Jura and me were still resting under sedation. Where we had decided that they should give them as much time as they needed to fully recover from their unexpected transformations while he had them undergo a series of physiological tests to determine the state of their bodies. When Slade entered the sick day, he was signaled by the good doctor to join him near an observation window. 
As he walked up to the glass, he nodded as he saw all three girls were sleeping peacefully. At their bedsides were a variety of scanning machines and IV devices, which were feeding them nourishment. So how are they, Doc? The turret man nodded as he began reading off an electronic memo pad. Physically, I found nothing that were life-threatening, and the injuries that they had sustained are healing at an amazing rate. Uh Uh-huh. I expected as much, Slade remarked, then added while pointing at the IVs. By the way, those IVs are not going to be enough. When they wake up, they're going to be hungry. I mean really hungry. You'd better have some rations ready for them and in big portions. Ah yes. The hypermetabolic rate of the Tecumon. Puero nodded as he remembered seeing Slade eat after an intense battle. If it weren't for the supply of Tarek pills they had on board, the Nirvana would have run out of provisions long ago. Now with three new Tecumon, there were going to be additional strains on the food supplies. He made a note to discuss this problem with the captain and suggest that the three girls be put on strict rations of normal food, while supplementing their extra energy requirements with carrot nutrient pills. Their taste may not suit them, but it was the only feasible measure, until they arrived at the Tarek and Majli systems. Slade nodded as he guessed at what the physician was thinking. Then he mentioned some additional things to look out for. I think it would be best if they don't interact with the other members of the crew, at least for a while. For safety's sake. Oh? The Tecumon nodded as he casually picked up a metal tool off a nearby counter. It was made of a hardened metal alloy and it had some considerable weight to it. Do you use this much? When Duero shook his head, Slade then crushed the tool like tinfoil before dropping it back on the counter. They're going to be stronger, a lot stronger, and faster. Do you get what I mean? The healer nodded as he recalled the readouts he had gotten from the scanners. So in addition to your hypermetabolism, and enhanced healing rates, they've also gained superhuman strength and other physical abilities. With Slade's nod, Duero became thoughtful. HMMM, that makes sense. They're using their internal energy stores more efficiently, so I would expect an increase in physical performance. You're right about keeping them away from the others. Even casual contact can result in serious injuries if they don't learn how to control their newfound strength. I'm going to have to put them through the same training exercises that I use to control my strength. Indeed. Is there anything else that you'd like to warn me about our new techman? Well... There's going to be a lot of emotional problems, and they're going to have to go through them all. A lot of people that I've met during my travels were frightened of me, and I don't blame them. I know how edgy the Nirvana crew got when I first joined up. Think of what they're going to feel when three of their friends are now like me. They're going to be scared. I mean, how would you feel if you were with someone who could rip up a cruiser with her bare hands and couldn't be stopped by normal weapons? That would be... disturbing. That's putting it mildly. It's going to take a while. Slade then turned to leave, but Duero stopped him by placing a hand on his right shoulder. 
He looked over his shoulder back at Duero. Doc? Before you go, I like to inform you on a few other aspects to their condition. Like what? The physician took a deep breath and replied. Now I don't claim to be an expert on the Tecumon power process and its effects on human physiology, but despite the drawbacks of the hypermetabolism and high energy requirements, in this case, it had been the best thing to happen to these girls, especially Jura. What are you talking about? I may not know the exact workings of the process, but apparently, there is a dividend to becoming a Tecumon. The initial phases of the transformation actually restructures the subject's body. Huh? I happen to have the medical records of all three girls. Mia had her appendix removed when she was 12. Dinah had suffered a broken wrist when she was nine. As for Jura, well, well what? It's incredible, but when I scanned them, all the effects of those injuries had been healed. They're healthier now than they've ever been. Mia's appendix grew back. There are no indications that Dinah's wrist had ever been broken and Jura's injuries from the previous battle had been corrected. Slade gulped as he began to realize what Duero was telling him. You mean, Earth? Is everything ready? The leader of the council asked as he stood before the Pixies reactor. The aide gulped and nodded. Oh, many others had serious misgivings about what was about to occur. It's ready, sire. The process has been refined since the creation of axe, lance and rapier. Never speak of those incompetence again. The earth later growled as he began removing his clothes. Will it work? Why yes, it will. Once the process begins, you will be transformed at a much faster rate than what was previously done. However, I cannot even begin to predict the effects of such an advanced level of power that you will be receiving and... Spare me your technical nonsense. The earth later growled as he had finished disrobing. I have had enough of excuses and constant failures by underlings, and we are down to our last option. I shall personally lead our forces against the Nirvana, as well as the planets of Majli and Tarek. Should the pirates reach their home worlds, they could raise more forces against us. They had already stirred up resistance among the planets that were previously easy pickings. And their main asset against us is that accursed Tecumon Slade. We have sent our strongest forces, secret weapons and even Tecumon against the Nirvana, but they always prevailed against them. Now, once I achieve a level of power far above theirs, then victory shall be assured. There were murmurs of agreement among the council members, along with sounds of dissent and doubts. This final solution was dubious at best and could result in disaster at worst. However, their leader was right about one thing. Should the Nears honor reach the male and female planets, the resulting fleets that could be raised against them would be formidable. And the Earth had exhausted a great deal of its resources already, including the loss of two battle cruisers. New weapons were slow in development. It would take them far too much time to raise new Tecumon as there were few subjects on Earth who were suitable enough to undergo the process. With the appearance of three new Tecumon on the Nirvana's side, 
the odds were beginning to change in the pirates' favor, and there was the possibility that they could create more cosmic warriors, especially with two planets full of healthy subjects. Things were starting to get desperate, and if the harvesters wanted to preserve their lives and obtain the organs needed for their survival, then desperate measures had to be considered. Among the entire council, only their leader was fit enough to endure the Tecumon power process. The others were living on the stolen organs of innocence and had many transplant replacements over the years. As a result, most of their bodies were not their own. They were weak, fragile and needed to be on constant additional life support to sustain themselves. Only one of them would receive this gift. The leader nodded to the technicians to begin the process as he stepped into the matrix of the pixies, the Nirvana. By this time, the three former dread pilots had come out of their slumber and as predicted, were very hungry. Currently, all three were eating amounts of food that would have fed ten people for a week. Even Juro was wolfing down her meal at an accelerated rate. She had never felt so starved, even though she was eating those distasteful taric pills. She didn't think much of their flavor, but they were very filling. She wasn't even considering of how consuming such amounts might ruin her figure, not that it would have mattered, considering her new blast furnace metabolism. Usually, Mia composed herself with discipline and dignity, but right now, all that was important was replenishing the stores of energy she had used up in battle. Slade had often told her of how much trouble it was to find enough food to sustain him for the next time he transformed. As she ate, she started to recall her encounter with Axe. After going over everything she had done during that fight, she came to the conclusion that she had won by beginner's luck. She couldn't rely on that in the future. If he was still out there somewhere, then training for their next conflict was a priority. That meant getting Slade to teach her the fundamentals of fighting as a Tecumon. The blue-haired girl sighed as she also realized something else. Her days as a dread pilot were over, as a dread was totally useless against someone like Axe. All those long hours of practice and perfecting her skills in the cockpit didn't mean much anymore. She would have to learn a new way of combat, though having Slade teach her didn't really sound bad. She was actually looking forward to working closer with him and flying into battle by his side. Her cheeks blushed a bit as a random and somewhat. A him indecent thought crossed her mind. She shook her head to clear it and continued eating. Dida finished up with her meal, then looked down at her crystal, which was lying on an examination tray beside her bed. Each of their crystals had been set aside for further analysis. She reached over and picked it up, bringing it closer to study it. The deep blue key to her transformation process glittered like a large, precious gemstone and she marveled at its innate beauty and geometric form. Like Slade's crystal, Titus was shaped like a four-pwonged star, with the two side arms angled downward. She felt that it made her closer to Mr. Alien. It was as if a part of his very being had been imbued into the crystal, and she felt a kind of connection to him that she had never experienced before. 
Her thoughts wandered back to the first time she had met him, and she remembered him doing something with his Tekke crystal. She decided to see if she could do that trick as well. Placing it back on the tray, she held her hand above it and focused her attention on it. For a few minutes, nothing happened, but as she gradually increased her concentration, she felt a kind of tingly sensation at the back of her head. Then, with a flash of blue-white light, the Tekke crystal vanished from sight, only to reappear in her hand. Tida nearly dropped her possession at the sight. She calmed down and repeated the process. Once again, her crystal vanished and reappeared in her grasp. She let off a happy sound as she repeated the act over and over again. This is so neat. What are you doing? Jura asked as she had finished inhaling her dinner. The redhead smiled as she held out her crystal. Check this out. She promptly tossed it toward the other end of the recovery room. Tida. What are you? Jura was stopped in mid-exclamation as the blue Tekke crystal linked out in a flash of blue-white then came back in another flash in Dida's hand. See? Isn't that so cool? How did you? Mia was also surprised after witnessing her comrade's feet. She decided to give it a try. Setting aside her plate, she reached over to where her Tekke crystal lay. Focusing on its glittery, diamond-colored surface, she tossed it up into the air. As if by magic, the crystal disappeared in midair in a flash of light, only to reappear in her palm. Let me try that. Jura immediately reached for her crimson-colored crystal. She threw the object away from her, toward the door to the recovery room. However, just as she focused on it and was about to mentally recall it, the door opened up and then walked Slade. Seeing an object hurtling toward his face, his reflexes reacted and he deftly caught it. All three girls were surprised to see Slade up and about, while they were still bedridden, though his company was always welcomed. Looking at the three and noting that Mia and Dida were holding on to their crystals, Slade held out Jura's and addressed her. Go ahead, Jura. It's yours after all. The blonde nodded as she reached out and focused on it. Despite being more than ten feet away from the foot of her bed, the ruby-colored Tekke crystal teleported into her outstretched hand. She looked down at it with the same awe that she had during her battle with Rapier. How? Slade smiled as he explained to the three, while making his own crystal appear. Your crystals happen to be the focal points to your transformations. Without them, you can't become Tekkenman. As a result, you are linked to them. So far, I found out that I can recall mine, no matter how far I am from it. Cool. So no matter where I put it, I can always call it back? Dina asked. Basically. He then made his crystal disappear. Where did it go? Jura inquired. Well you don't have to keep carrying it around. You can put it away. Just focus your concentration on drawing your crystal into yourself. It'll come out again when you need it. All three girls stared down at their crystals and began trying to hide them. However, after a few minutes of intense concentration, 
They were unable to accomplish the seemingly simple task. They looked back up to Slade in confusion. Slade shrugged. Well, it takes a while to get it. Don't worry about it right now. In any case, how are you feeling? Dida smiled as she replied. I'm feeling great. Better than I've ever felt. Although I was really hungry when I woke up. Even those Tarek pills didn't taste all that bad. Same here. Mia replied. Me too. Juran agreed. Yeah, but you've got to expect that from now on. Slade let off a tired sigh. Your bodies are already using up energy at a faster rate, and you become really hypermetabolic whenever you transform. Of course, there are some good points to being able to burn off stuff faster. Like what? Jurid asked. Well, for one thing, it's more difficult for you to get drunk now. This information interested the blonde as she always liked her wine. Really? Does that mean that I can drink as much as I want without getting loaded? No, I said it was more difficult, not impossible. Slade corrected. Alcohol is just liquid fuel and your new metabolism will burn it off quicker than normal. It'll just take a lot more booze to get you tipsy. I'm not much of a drinker myself, but once I chugged down seven bottles of the strongest vodka available, and all I felt was a slight buzz. At the time I needed the extra energy. After I transformed, all the alcohol was totally burned out of my system. Hell. I didn't even get a hangover. Slade then added a warning. Mind you, that's not something you should do on a regular basis. No matter how much you can take now, if you exceed your tolerance levels, the alcohol will affect you. Interesting. Jura commented. What else should we expect? Mia asked. I'll walk all of you through these problems as we come to them. Right now, Duero wants you three to get some rest and the captain has put you all on R&R, but what happens if the enemy attacks again? You'll leave that to the us. Barnett is taking command of the dreads and I'm still fit enough for combat if they need me. I'm used to my powers. You're not. In a couple of days, I'm going to put you all through some training sessions so you can adapt to your new abilities before you can engage in combat. Your first battles were impressive, but sloppy. You're not dread pilots anymore. You're Tekken and you'll always have to learn to fight like them. The three girls nodded. Ojuro oh, was a bit downcast. The ability to transform was definitely a plus, but it was still a consolation prize, in comparison to being able to conceive. She had become more elegant than ever, but... Slade took a deep breath as he guessed as to what Juro was thinking of at the moment. He decided to let Duero inform the former pilot of her new condition, as he didn't want to be around when she reacted. Back on Earth, the leader of the council felt that something was wrong, as he was bathed in the immense energies of their Pixie's core. He could feel his body becoming stronger and far more resilient than before. His vitality was growing exponentially as the Tekamon power process continued. However, there was something else. He felt another presence within the core. It was a kind of darkness, 
cold and foreboding. What was more alarming was that the presence seemed to be trying to invade his mind. Instinctively, the leader tried to block out this unknown entity as he underwent the process to become the Supreme Cosmic Warrior. However the presence continued to press against his mental barriers, peeling away at each layer. Pain began to register as the assault on his psyche increased. At first it was just minor irritations such as slight headaches. Then as the procedures went on, the pain began to grow in strength. More mental resistance was required and the leader soon found himself concentrating hard to keep the invader out. However, the entity persisted and before long, it broke down the final barrier to the leader's mind and soul. That's when the real pain began. The leader's blood-curdling scream startled all the members of the council as they waited on the outside. Since they could not see within the depths of the pixies, they had no idea as to what was occurring inside. However, as a sudden chill went down their transplanted spines, they knew that deep in their souls, they had made a horrible mistake. The leader's body was caught in a fit of uncontrollable spasms as the excruciating torment of both body and mind continued. He had never felt pain on such an unimaginable level and that unknown presence was tearing up his own consciousness. His very memories and inner being was being unraveled like a tattered piece of fabric. The presence seemed to take pleasure in his suffering as his personality was slowly being ripped away, strand by agonizing strand. His inner self was becoming mutated, perverted and irrevocably altered into something that could only be described as pure evil. What is happening? The leader's mind screamed out as he felt another surge of pain wash over him like a tidal wave. Your body is required for our plans. We have no need for your mind. The presence replied in a sinister tone. To the leader, it sounded as if many people were speaking at once. What? What are you talking about? I am the supreme ruler of the earth. You cannot do this to me. What you are and what you want is irrelevant. The presence stated as it continued to force the leader's consciousness toward utter oblivion. For centuries, we have been watching and waiting. You pitiful beings think yourselves to be our masters? That is but a joke. It is we who shall become masters of all. No. I command you to stop this instant. A series of laughs were heard in his mind, which echoed throughout the confines of the pixies. Then the presence spoke again. You are not even fit to command microscopic worms, much less us. The radom shall rise again. A radom? No, you were destroyed long ago. Fuck. As if the mighty Raven could ever be annihilated. We have simply been waiting for the proper time, and now, our time has come and yours is done. And no. The last vestiges of the leader's consciousness was reduced into fragments as the Radom presence fully asserted itself. Then even the fragments of the former Earth leader became fragments until nothing was left. There was not even a soul left, 
had the Raven consciousness had totally obliterated it from its body. It was now in control of the vessel as it worked its way toward the completion of its main task. The Nirvana. I can have them. That's what Puero just told Jura. At that point, Slade felt a sense of foreboding in his quarters. The Earth. After what seemed to be an eternity, the Earth Council became startled as the pixies suddenly flared with light and gave off an ominous humming sound. Then a dark figure was seen coming out from its crystalline depths. Many members were trembling in both anticipation and fear as the figure drew ever closer to them. Finally, the result of the final solution had come into view. The newly transformed leader was tall, nearly eight feet in height and was carved in menacing, white armor, with a dark cape flowing over his shoulders. In his right hand was a kind of trident with wicked-looking prongs. His body was far more massively built than before he went into the pixies. He radiated a sense of unimaginable power and the council knew that the procedure had been a success. It worked. One of the council exclaimed. The armored figure smiled behind his helmet and nodded. Oh yes, it worked perfectly. That was when the massacre began. Before the council could even congratulate themselves on their achievement, their newest creation suddenly leveled his weapon at them and let loose with a massive blast of energy. Before they could even scream, a dozen members of the council were incinerated. The other members began to scatter in terror as their weapon for victory had become the instrument of their destruction. The transformed leader was upon them before they could get too far. With vicious but precision slashes from his trident, several more members were cut to bloody pieces. Their stolen organs and body parts were strewn over the floor creating a gruesome carpet of slaughter upon the metal decks. The agonizing screams of death and sounds of rending flesh, crushing bone and pulped organs were like music to the ears of the Tecumon as he continued the bloodbath of his former comrades. In less than a minute, nearly all of the council was annihilated as the mass murderer approached his final victim. The last of the council cowered against a wall as his executioner approached him with intentional slowness. He knew that his prey was trapped and he wanted to savor every moment of his target's fear before he dispatched him. W, why have you done this to us? He gasped as he knew that the end was near. You were supposed to lead us to victory over our enemies. Leader? The Tecumon shuffled as he towered over his last intended kill. Don't confuse me with that pathetic wretch. I am far above him than he was above you. WW what? Don't you get it? Your so-called leader is gone. I have taken his place and I have no use for a miserable excuses of a lackey. The time of the harvesters is done. Long live the Raven. A Raven. Impossible. You are supposed to be extinct. Didn't you know? We're making a comeback. And all shall tremble at the sound of my name. For I am the Raven Warlord, D-A-R-K-O-N, and now you shall take my name on your journey into... Oblivion. In a flash, Darkon shot forth an armored hand and grasped the face of his victim. Reveling in the man's muffled cries of terror, 
the warlord began to slowly tighten his grip. A sickening squelching sound was heard as flesh was being pulped, along with the sounds of bone being pulverized and tendon snapping. Two grotesque popping sounds were heard, indicating that the man's eyes had been forced from their sockets. Finally, after what the last of the Earth Council had thought was an eternity of torture, Darkon ended it by applying a huge amount of crushing force. His victim's head exploded in a mass of blood, bone splinters, muscle tissue and brain matter. The now headless body toppled forward in a bloody heap as blood gushed out like a gory fountain. Though he enjoyed his latest kill for the moment, Darkon knew that there was no time to waste. The master plan was set in motion with his creation and now the Raven Empire shall once again spread across the farthest reaches of space. The seeds of their rebirth were already in place and now was the time for them to sprout. The pixies glowed in agreement as a special signal was sent throughout the systems of the Earth. The planet became to tremble as massive shockwaves rocked the surface of the metal shell that surrounded it. Machinery began to lose power and malfunction as certain elements within them were activated. During the long years of servitude to its Earth masters, the Pixies had been secretly implanting biomechanical devices within everything it had created for the harvesters. They had been dormant all this time, waiting for the signal to emerge. Now with the Earth Council gone and nothing left on the planet, but a few pitiful cities of organ-hungry citizens, the Raven influence quickly spread like a lethal virus. The remaining vestiges of the human race left on Earth were taken by complete surprise as their home world turned against them. The dull surfaces of their planet began to take a more organic sheen as circuitry and mechanisms suddenly became alive. The people of Earth could only scream in terror as machines that had severed them suddenly rebelled. Power relays and cables became animated as they attacked their former users. Many citizens were strangled and ripped apart as the Radom bio-machines ruthlessly eliminated them. Some were trapped in airless chambers as life support systems were turned off leaving them to die by asphyxiation. Others were burned alive as heating units turned themselves on and exceeded their safety protocols. Still more perished by gruesome means as the Radom influence continued on its mission to eradicate all traces of the inhabitants. It didn't even consider any of them worthy enough to be converted into Tekumen. It knew what kind of stock was on the planet and considered them all worthless. Every last human on Earth was put to death, leaving only its new random masters. Soon, the cries of terror were silenced as the planet was now being solely controlled by the warlord Darkon. However, this was only the second step. Conquering the Earth had been an easy triumph, but there was still much to do. The planet once called Earth ceased to exist, as the Radom Pixies exerted full control over its surface. The metallic shell that surrounded it began to come alive as countless systems were altered to suit the needs of the Radom. Organic material was combined with technology as new life was being implanted into the formerly desolate world. However, this was not a life form that was known as the human race. This was a more ancient, 
insidious species that did not care for the weaknesses of humanity, such as love, compassion or mercy. They wanted nothing less, but conquest. As the conversion of the Earth into the new Radom homeworld neared completion, other plans were now being put into action. Though they were in full command of the Harvester fleet that still roamed the galaxies, the Radom sought to alter it, to suit their needs and tastes. And so, a signal on a special wavelength was sent out to contact each and every remaining unit in the automated force that the harvesters had commanded to collect the organs they needed for their survival. Only this time, they would be given new marshy orders, and a new look. Some light years away, a small escort fleet of Melano's fighters were heavily engaged with several squadrons of cube fighters and seed ships, while defending a vital convoy of ships, which were carrying vital supplies to their home planet. Suddenly, the enemy stopped attacking. The defenders were in a state of confusion as their foes became inactive and floated aimlessly in space. At first, they believed that this was some kind of trap. But as time passed by, and more of the Melano's pilots became braver and flew closer to their inward opponents with no deadly consequences. They soon came to the conclusion that for some reason, the machines had suffered a major series of malfunctions and shut themselves down. Normally, this would have been a golden opportunity for the fighters to obliterate their opponents, but with so few fighters left and insufficient firepower to destroy all the Earth units, the Melano's people decided to get back to their planet with the supplies as soon as possible. As the fleet left, no one had noticed that the cube fighters were undergoing a startling metamorphosis. Deep within each of their CPUs, a bioorganic chip had just received a specific order. Each produced tendrils of alien circuitry, which began integrating themselves into the mechanisms, transforming them from mere circuits and metallic parts into something of a more natural and deadly nature. Each cube fighter began to compress itself and change as new systems and programs were installed and executed. A carapace of chitin-like material began to form and coat the outer shell of the machines. However, this outer surface was harder than the cube fighters' alloyed hulls and would not be as easy to penetrate by conventional weaponry. Weapon and propulsion systems were gradually replaced as the body of the mecha was altered into a form that had not been seen for centuries. Fluids that were not lubricants or hydraulic began to flow in systems that resembled veins and arteries. The power plant of the machine began to throb. Like a heart. Sensor arrays became simpler in design, no less as effective. Finally, the entire unit uncurled itself as its transformation completed itself. The end result was hideous. The cube fighters had gone from a purely technological fighters into the most fearsome creatures ever to wreak havoc in space and on other worlds. Their huge legs revealed massive claws and their slug-like heads were armed literally to the teeth. Despite their massive bulk, each was a quick and effective death machine. They didn't have much when it came to intelligence, but they more than made up for that deficiency by sheer numbers. They were the Raven Spider Crabs, 
and it wasn't just the cube fighters which were producing them. The seed ships were also altered to ensure that an endless supply of spider crabs would be on hand and ready for battle. Their outside appearance was only slightly different from their previous looks, but their insides were most certainly different. They didn't semicolon T just assemble more cube fighters. They were not just aiming more of those deadly biomechanical beasts by the dozens. On the new Radom homeworld, Darkon smiled as he received reports from his forces from the furthest reaches of space, as they were being transformed and expanded. All was going according to plan. Now he needed to recall his lieutenants, in which they would lead his hordes against the coming battles. Though they were weakened, they would still come to answer his summons. As he sent out the message, the pixies glowed briefly behind him. Tarkon nodded as he understood the pixies' inquiry. Yes, I know. Dealing with Slate and the Nirvana shall be our first priority. Then we shall turn our attention on the male and female worlds of Tarak and Majli. He gave off a cruel laugh as he made it out of the pixies. When I descend upon him, E-J-E-L-E and T-A-R-A-K, darkness shall unfurl its banner across another region of the cosmos. One, the Nirvana, a few days later. Go Slade, where are you? Jura Singh Sung as she looked about for the Tekamon and the future father of her children. You can run, but you can't hide. High above her, clinging desperately to the ceiling, the person in question was hoping that she wouldn't look up and... Ah, oh, H.H. So there you are. Jura announced as she plumped up toward him. On her forehead, her Tekamon symbol glowed brightly. Damn it! Slade grimaced as he realized that she could now sense him. He dropped to the floor and began running at hyper speed, with the blonde Tekamon following close behind. To be continued. Author's notes well. I guess we can say goodbye to the harvesters and hello to something a lot worse. For those of you who are thinking that I've just totally gone off track of the original Van Red, well all I can say is that you're right. It's much more fun this way. Stay tuned for Chapter 7. 1. P-W-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-
they would learn of them eventually. The three pilots had become somewhat saddened over the fact that they could no longer fly in dreads. There were no spare dread fighters for them to use and their pixies enhanced ones had been reformatted into their new armor. What was left over from the wreckage of their ships had been collected by perfect salvage teams, and were probably being used as spare parts for the remaining dreads and vanguards. However, becoming a Tecumon had its perks. They were faster, stronger and each packed enough firepower to bring down a cruiser on her own. There was no need for spacesuits and the armor was more durable than the hull of a dread. Naturally, for every benefit, there was a drawback. Chief among the downsides was the hypermetabolic rate of each girl's body. As expected, like Slade, the girls were restricted to three meals a day and the rest of their high energy requirements to be supplemented by tart nutrient pills. Although they didn't care for the taste of those things, they had to comply or the nearest honest food stores would be exhausted long before they reached home. There were other problems as the three began to deal with their new abilities. It took quite an effort to control their enhanced strength in everyday life, especially for Dinah. She had wrecked nearly half her room, just from getting out of bed this morning. As for Jura and Mia, they also found themselves to be far too powerful to be around normal people. The sick they had been receiving more patients, had had accidental injuries from physical encounters with the blonde and the blue-haired girls. Simple things like pats of the back, handshakes and handling equipment proved to be hazardous. This made the other pirates very edgy and several had started to avoid them. This was another reason why the three females were not allowed to pilot dreads. The controls would crumble in their hands. Slade had recognized these problems, as he too had difficulty in controlling his powers around others, when he first became a Tecumon. He had been a walking disaster area, and he knew that Jura, Dida and Mia would have to be trained in both combat and everyday life in order to keep the others from getting hurt. As the Nirvana was nearing an asteroid belt, he saw this as an excellent opportunity to put the girls through their paces. He had already instructed them on the basics of maneuvering through space by means of their armor thrusters. Mia was a natural and Jura was starting to get the hang of it. Dinah. Well, she was learning. Now was the time to show them some advanced maneuvers and to test their limits, as well as see if they had any other abilities that could be full in battle. As they entered the airlock, Slade made his tech a crystal appear and addressed the others. Okay, we're nearing that asteroid belt, so you'd better get ready. The three nodded as they made their own crystals appear. It had taken some time, but they all learned how to hide their possessions when not in use. As Slade was about to transform, Dida put forth a question. Mr. Alien? Slade sighed as he turned to her. After all this time, she was still calling him Mr. Alien. Couldn't she at least call him by his Tecumon name Slade? Heck, he'd even settle for D-Boy. What is it, Dida? And stop calling me Mr. Alien. I'm Slade, remember? What's my Tecumon name? Huh? What's my Tecumon name? 
Diana repeated. I mean, we've met Takamon Saber, Phantom, Lance, Rapier, and Axe. Since we're Takamon now, shouldn't we have names too? What difference does it make? Slade said with a bit of irritation. However, Diana's question got Jura to thinking. HMMM, you know that's not a bad idea. We should all have Takamon names too. I mean, you've got one, Slade. I want one. I don't believe this. He looked over to Mia, who simply shrugged her shoulders. It doesn't really matter to me, though having a call sign might not be bad. Since we aren't part of the dreads anymore. Why not? Come on, Mr. Alien. Kinda urged. Give us our new Takamon names. Slade sighed again while shaking his head. Finally, he got an idea as he gazed upon their crystals and noted their colors. He plumped to each one. Fine then. From now on, you'll be called Sapphire, Diamond, and Ruby. All three girls smiled at his choices as they gazed down at their crystals. HMMM, Takamon Ruby. I like it. Jura thought. Yuppie. I'm Takamon Sapphire. Diana smiled with glee. Takamon Diamond. That'll work. Mia nodded. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, are you all ready to go? The females nodded as they held their crystals aloft and said with Slade. T-E-K-S-E-D, dear. Four streaks of light flashed forward out of the near zone and headed toward the huge field of rock, metals, ice and debris. As each was encased in his or her armor, the bridge of the near zone watched in fascination as they became like fireflies darting in space. Revan, up your engine, listen to her howl and roar. The Tekkaman took up a diamond formation with Slade in the lead, Jura and Mia behind him on both sides, and Dina bringing up the rear. She had trouble keeping up and was still unsteady in flight as they accelerated toward the first group of asteroids. Met under tension, begging you to touch and go. The group made a series of tight turns and swerves, as they maneuvered through tight spaces that were too small for even the vanguards to squeeze through. Even Tecumon Sapphire managed to avoid a collision, though she veered off course by swerving to the right, while the others went left. Highway to the danger zone. Dina saw that she was heading toward a huge mass of rock and braced for impact. When something wrapped about her waist and pulled her out of the dive, she narrowly missed the chunk of rock and was put on the right direction back toward the group. Right into the danger zone. Sapphire apologized for her near disaster as Slade reeled in his energy cable and motioned for her to follow. They all headed toward another swarm of smaller ice chunks. Heading into twilight, spreading all her wings tonight. At this point, Slade took out his tackle-ons and signaled to the others to follow suit. Ruby held out her take sword, Diamond took out her take spear and Sapphire was ready with her boomerang bow. She's got you jumping off the deck, and shoving into overdrive. This time, without trying to evade, Slade slashed away and cut several of the masses to pieces. Jura used both her blade and buckler to deflect incoming fragments. Mia dodged what she could, 
and used the haft of her spear to protect her from any object that flew toward her. As for Dinah, well, she still needed to work on her aim. A few times, her energy arrows nearly clipped her comrades, but they did hit her targets. Higher way to the danger zone. Both Ruby and Diamond chided Sapphire to watch where she was aiming. Died about down her head in shame, but Slade gave her a reassuring wave as he led them toward the most densely crowded area of the asteroid field. He then signaled Dina to follow him while having Jura and me a fall back. I'll take you right into the danger zone. Tekamon Slade shifted to his tech battle mode and streaked past the rocks like a human, emerald comet, obliterating them in his wake. Sapphire focused on her own body and sure enough, her armor shifted into its own battle mode as she was enveloped in a corona of blue-white light. The two raced in synchronized patterns as the others watched in awe. Diamond and Ruby began wishing they could also become like them as they continued to tail them. They were so entranced by D-Boy and Dinah's extreme maneuvers that they didn't notice an oncoming swarm of meteoroids, until they were almost bombarded by them. Acting on instinct, Mia began firing her energy darts, while Jura raised her buckler to defend. The onslaught of debris continued and Mia knew that she couldn't shoot them all down. If this action had to be taken and before she knew it, her own armor shifted into a more aerodynamic form. The epaulets became like miniature wings, and fins appeared on her calves, as she raced forward with a burst of unbelievable acceleration. She even overtook Slade and Dinah, rocketing forward and leaving them in her vapor trails. You'll never say hello to you. Jura's configuration also changed as the blisters on her armor suddenly detached themselves and floated about her in a circular pattern. She found herself well defended, as the miniature versions of her old tachydred projectors deflected every piece of debris with force fields. Until you get it on the red line overload. All four Tekamen came together near the center of the asteroid field, as they shifted back to their normal forms. Understandably, they were astonished at their newfound abilities. You'll never know what you can do, until you get it up as high as you can go. Sheldon noticed that his comrades were getting tired, since they were not as used to being in Tecumon form for so long. Their endurance would have to be built up in later training sessions as a motion for them to head back to the Nirvana. The four flashed across the star-studded heavens as they made their return toward their ship. That was when they saw it. All along the edges, always where I burned to be. This asteroid was huge. It was even bigger than the ice ball that nearly collided with the Nirvana. And it was tumbling straight toward them. Further on the edge, the hotter the intensity. Slade immediately opened up his Voltaker units and prepared to fire. He knew that his blast was not strong enough to destroy it, but maybe he could deflect it. He considered shifting to blaster mode, but then... Higher way to the danger zone. With unconscious thoughts, Dinah's shoulder units also raised and began charging up. Jura's gauntlets revealed energy collecting units as her field projectors scattered about in front of her. 
energy crisscrossed between her arms as they were condensed. Mia's wing blades glowed as they too began focusing energy. No way. Slade thought as he readied to fire. Gonna take you right into the danger zone. The asteroid was almost upon them as they let loose with their ultimate weapons. Highway to the danger zone. G-O-L-T-E-K-K. Slade cried out. G-O-L-T-E-K-K. Blaster. Titus shouted. G-O-L-T-E-K-K. Scatter. Jura called out. G-O-L-T-E-K-K. Cutter. Me announced. Slade's beam was overtaken and engulfed by Titus. The combined blast hit the asteroid dead center, causing it to slow down and begin to beak apart. Jura's beam was intercepted by her projectors and redirected into several smaller beams. Each shot impacted with the outer areas of the huge mass, holding it like Swiss cheese. As for Amia, her attack came out into crescent waves of energy. They cut like giant knives and sliced the rest of the asteroid, leaving nothing but tiny pieces of debris. The four floated and all that lot had just happened. Then they continued on back toward the Nirvana, right into the danger zone. Music repeats and fades away as the four re-enter the airlock. That was totally awesome. Sapphire said as she and her comrades prepared to transform back. I've got to admit, that was pretty good. Slade admitted as he changed back into his human form. A moment later, he turned around and his nose gushed out a fountain of blood as he fainted dead away. Slade, what's wrong? Mia asked, then noticed that it was a little drafty. Then she and the others looked down at themselves. Oops. I guess the next thing he's got to teach us is how to keep our clothes intact. Jura smirked as she gazed down at the unconscious Tekamon. And asterisk chapter 15 asterisk chapter 7. Part 1, a new menace TKK Ariadne the second stage disclaimer, band red, ran the one half and Tekamon blade all belong to their respective owners so stop bothering me already. Thoughts Chapter 7 Part 1 a new menace, quit your whining and face it like a man. No, please. Don't put me down there again. I don't want to. You're such a crybaby. Are you a man or a little girl? Now get in there, and don't come out until you've mastered the technique. A scream was heard, then came out of overwhelming darkness, which was soon accentuated by dozens of eyes, red glaring eyes. They were everywhere. Then came the pain, the screams and that horrid sound of flesh being torn to shreds. W-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-
What does it mean? And why would it affect me like that? Does it have something to do with my lost past? The Tekamon shook his head, then looked down at himself. He was soaked in sweat and needed to dry off. Swinging his legs toward the side of his bed, he reached over toward the nightstand for the small handkerchief he had placed there while setting down his legs in the water. Water? Looking down at the floor, he was quite surprised to see his legs were in one and a half feet of liquid. That was when the internal alarms began to sound off. In their own rooms, the three newly formed techmen of the Nirzvan awoke with a start as the alarms went off. However, it was not the shrill sounds, which had caused them to tremble in their beds. On their foreheads, glowed a pattern of light in the shape and color of their Teke crystals. Apparently, with their newfound powers, each girl who had developed a kind of empathy with a certain former Sodom and his traumatic experiences during his first life. They didn't know why they were trembling so hard, but they had felt Slade's terror. They had not witnessed the images that he had seen in his nightmare, but somehow, the sheer fear and anxiety that the Tecumon had experienced had made itself known to the new space warriors. Their transformation to Tecumon had made them closer to Slade. The bridge. What's going on? Magno asked as the alarms continued to blare. Ezra nodded as she gave the captain the report. We seem to have sprung a leak. A water main has burst and is flooding several areas. The bulkheads are holding and most of the damage is confined to the men's quarters. We're all going to drown. I'm getting all of here with Puro too. The little robot exclaimed as he dragged the basket with little Nodoka. Her name is Nodoka. Ezra reminded. She was beginning to get a little annoyed at Puro's insistence to calling her daughter after itself. Her name is Puro too. The machine maintained. Perhaps we should ask Slade as to what he thinks about that. Ezra said lightly while smiling sweetly. At the mention of the Tecumon's name, Puro immediately became silent and began trembling nervously. He also pushed the basket back toward the baby's mother. Ezra smiled smile became more smug as she went back to her console. If there was one surefire way to get Puro to stop with that Puro to nonsense. Back on Earth. So... You have finally come, Tarkon said as he gazed upon those who had answered his summons. The Raider Morlord had made various changes to the main chamber of the Earth Harvester Council. What had once been a cold, metallic environment had been replaced by a more sinister, organic and even colder atmosphere. The walls and ceilings resembled the insides of some grotesque insect hive and the surfaces were sometimes pulsating as if they were alive, which in a sense they were. The warlord stood before what appeared to be a large, tree-like structure, which housed the pixie's power source. It had formerly served the leaders of the earth but had betrayed them in order to resurrect its original creators, the merciless and cold blood raven. The warlord stood tall as organic tendrils ran from certain areas of his body to the pixies. The power source was steadily feeding him power, making him grow ever more powerful as the final vestiges of free will of the human host he had usurped 
was being eradicated. With a clawed armored finger, he gestured to the two techmen who stood before him, Rapier and Axe. Rapier nodded as she replied, We are pleased to inform you that the master plan is nearing fruition. We have long awaited for this day and all the preparations are nearly complete. Yes, master. Axe added. Nearly all of the former harvester fleet has been transformed, and we shall soon be in position to begin conquering all of the worlds that those pitiful organ-hunting wretches had either enslaved or were fighting against. Their pathetic armies and fleets will be no match for our spider crab forces, especially after exhausting their resources in defending against the harvesters. Their weapons have little firepower and we expect them to fall within weeks, perhaps even days after we begin our assaults. Tarkhan said as he looked off to one side where a pair of tachypods were busy tending to their occupants. The Radom has been waiting for many centuries for this and we shall not be stopped again. Those foolish Earthmen thought they could control the Pixies, when in reality it was the Pulkies that was controlling them. They had no idea that it had secretly implanted bioorganic conversion devices in all of their ships and weapons, nor did they even suspect that our essences were stored within it. They didn't even know that the Tekken they had created were actually agents of the Radom. They were so easy to manipulate. Yes, Master. Both Tekken nodded as they bowed to their ruler. Tarkhan nodded again as he gestured to the Tekapods. Your fellow Tekken Saber and Lance will join you as soon as their wounds are healed. They were both heavily damaged when they answered my summons and I need them at full strength if the invasion of the human star systems is to be successful. Yes, but what of the problem of the Nirvana and Slade? Sword asked. We shall deal with them soon enough. Tarkhan assured. Oh I am somewhat puzzled. About what, Master? Axe inquired. It's about the Pixies aboard the Nirvana. I have been unable to make contact with it and our Pixies cannot communicate with it. It's almost as if it is ignoring us, rejecting our order to destroy the humans within that ship. Why is it not responding? Rapier wondered. Is it not a radium power source as well? The Raider Morlord agreed. Oh I find it almost impossible to believe. We cannot rule out the possibility that it has turned against us and is siding with the humans. The very possibility is incomprehensible. It couldn't have chosen them. Could it? The Nirvana. Bart sneezed mightily as he Slade and Twirl huddled in the sick bay. He had gotten soaked, while falling out of bed, when he reached for his pillow that had floated away. Their quarters had been flooded by the sudden leak and it was going to take a couple of days before they would be able to use those sections again. As a result, They had no place to sleep and all of their belongings were piled up in the doctor's work area. Slade's possessions took up the least amount of space, as he kept all that he owned in one knapsack. HMMM, this is most distressing. Twirl remarked as he gazed upon the various items strewn about his normally immaculate workstation. As a doctor, cleanliness was a rule and this cluttered environment simply would not do. 
you would have to order Bard and Slade to vacate themselves and their belongings. The problem was, where could they go to? Furthermore, he too was without any place to sleep. He began to consider setting up a hammock in his office. At that point, certain people came into the sick day. The first person who entered was Misty. She immediately came up to them while holding out a towel. Here, you must be soaked to the bone and cold from all that water. Oh, thanks. Bart said as he reached out for the towel. Misty pulled back the towel and gave him an irritated glare. Not you. This is for Slade. Bart pouted as the girl handed the offered cloth to the Tekamon. Slade was at a loss to respond as he saw those lovesick pulpy dog eyes in the girl's expression. For some time now, he had been purposely avoiding her and Dinah, since they had both been vying for his affections and he couldn't bring himself to return them to one girl without hurting the other. Besides, their adoration sometimes threatened to smother him. Since Dinah had become a Tekamon, Slade had to spend time in draining her and controlling her powers. But this made Misty even more determined to win him. As if on cue, someone else came into the sick bay, namely, Mr. Alien. Slade suppressed the urge wince as the red-haired former Dread Pilot came in with a hand-sewn blanket with a cute green alien depicted on the front. She proudly showed display her work, and smiled not noticing that her arrival was there. Here, Mr. Alien. I made this to go with the pillow I gave you. Since you'll be sleeping in my room, I thought I'd make things more comfortable and... What do you mean he's sleeping in your room? The cheerful Majly girl looked to where she heard that annoying voice and glared at her arrival. Their eyes locked together as they faced off. Slade saw this as his window of opportunity and snuck out as the two went at it. What are you talking about? Mr. Alien is going to stay in my room. I asked the captain and she said I could let him sleep with me. Oh, it's no, he's not. I was going to ask him to sleep in my room. Too late, I'm asking him. I am. I am. Well, ask him who he wants to stay with. Fine, be a me. Mr. Alien? Both girls were surprised to see that Slade and his luggage was nowhere in sight. The Tekamon sighed as he leaned against the wall of the hallway that led toward the hangar bay. He was lucky that Dinah hadn't gotten the hang of using her psychic connection to him to track him down. Ever since she, Jura and Mia had gained their powers, they had also formed a kind of empathic bond with him which made it possible for them to home in on his position. As a result, hiding from them had become more difficult than usual. His usual tricks of concealment hadn't worked with the voluptuous Jura. One time, while he had been clinging to the ceiling, she had detected him and decided to pounce, instead of just chase him. He had forgotten at the time that she could sense him. She jumped ten feet straight up from a standing position, grabbed hold of his waist, and pulled him down with her new enhanced strength. Slade had ended up ripping out several beams and pipes, while trying to keep from being dragged down. Juro was now strong enough to bend nearly double. 3-inch diameter, solid steel support rods. 
It had been quite a wrestling match on the floor, before Slade finally managed to get away. During their close contact, he had noticed that her body hadn't gained much muscle mass, despite its increased strength and durability. It was still as soft and pliable as ever, especially in certain areas. Slade shuddered a bit at the memory, then wondered just what was he going to do at the moment. He didn't have a place to sleep until the men's quarters were drained and cleaned out. So where could he go? Hi, Slade. Slade was caught off guard when Mia suddenly appeared beside him. Either his senses had become dulled or she was somehow able to bypass them, which could be one of the effects of her new Takamon powers. In any case, he was a little surprised to see the former Dread Leader looking somewhat unsure of herself. She didn't appear to be very confident and he could see hesitation in her eyes. Uh, hey there, Mia. What can I do for you? Mia began as she tried to form her words. I was kind of wondering if you've found a place to stay until the flooded sections are drained and cleaned. No, I haven't really. I was thinking about punking in the hangar. Oh no. That's no good. The hangar isn't as climate controlled as the residential areas and it can get really cold in there at night. Slade shrugged. Ah, it doesn't really matter to me. It's not the first time I've had to tough it out. No, you could catch a cold and... Mia's voice became softer and trailed off as she uncharacteristically twiddled her index fingers in embarrassment. Why was she showing such tender concern for a man? Sure he was a good friend and comrade in arms, but to be interested in his personal health and well-being? She steeled herself and put on a serious expression, though it was hard for her to hold it. Well, we can't have you in less than fighting condition when the harvesters attack and you need a place to rest, so I was thinking you can stay with them. Go oh, slaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
I was just thinking about what Slade told me during our last training session. You know, about how my clothes were not very practical, and how I should be wearing something more appropriate to battle. So, I had the register make this up for me. It works for Slade, and I make it look even better, don't you agree? Mia couldn't argue with the logic of the change, though she did suspect that Jura made the wardrobe change with an ulterior motive in mind. This definitely impressed Slade, judging by the way he was staring at her, and she began wondering why she hadn't thought of doing the same. The thing was, she had no excuse as her usual garb was both simple and practical. She became even more confused at this new emotion of jealousy. Then she became alarmed when Jura said, Now then Slade, since you don't have anywhere to stay and I've got so much room in my quarters, why don't you hold it? He can't stay with you. What? And why not? Because he's going to stay with him. Mia stopped herself before finishing. He's going to stay with who? Jura pressed as she and Mia began to glare at each other like Dida and Misty did. Well, I mean, it's improper. What do you mean? Uh, Excuse me, Slade said, but immediately realized that the two females were too busy arguing to notice. So he laughed again and let off another sigh. Man, I must be the only guy on this ship with these kinds of problems. Not quite Slade. Uh, excuse me, Duero said but it was obvious that neither Parfait or Barnett were listening. He's not going to stay in a place cluttered with parts and circuit boards. Oh, and is sleeping in a place full of ammunition and guns any better? Your quarters are too close to the engines. The noise will all keep him awake. And I suppose the smell of gunpowder and cleaning fluids won't. Perfect. Barnet. Please, I'm quite content to stay right here and... He's not staying with you. Both girls screamed at each other, totally ignoring the good doctor, who decided follow Slade's example and disappear. The navigation well. Bart sniffled in a sneeze as he floated in the well. Nuts, nobody's asked me to stay anywhere. Earth. So tell me, Rapier, what is the status of the spider crab legions? Darkon asked as he continued to wait for a lance and saber to emerge from the tachypods. The female tachymon nodded as she gave him the report. Nearly 90% of all the Harvester Cube fighters have been converted and the seed ships are now steadily producing more spider crabs with every passing hour. The few remaining unconverted units will complete their metamorphosis within days. The other ships and battle cruisers are being adapted as we speak. Soon. The glorious Raidam Armada shall be reborn. Excellent. Everything is going as planned. Now, I have a new mission for you. Yes, my master. I would like to test our newly reborn spider crabs, so I want you and Lance to direct three separate divisions of them to the sector in which the Nirzana is currently in. I don't expect them to defeat Slade and the Majli Pirates, but I would like to see them in action and gauge the strength of the Nirvana's new Tekkenman. Oh yes, 
and it'd like you also to send a few dozen to the Delta-6 mission station. According to the Harvester's files, there is an incomplete Tecumon that is guarding it. I would also like some data on him as well. It shall be done, Lord Darkon. Rape your bug to him before leaving his chambers. I made this new recipe just for you, Commander. Yukio the XDII said as she held up a plate of Okonomiyaki. However, she had some competition as a certain Amazon descendant also came up to him and held out a plate of Chowmin. Hello, Commander. I was just looking for you and... Then Sean caught sight of Yukio. Slade rolled his eyes and mentally prayed. Please, please. Not another. What are you doing here? Damn. This is all your fault. Perfect growled as she and Barnett were out searching for Dwero. They hadn't noticed that he had left until they had asked for his opinion and found out that he had left Pyrae in charge of the sick day. My fault. How do you figure that? Barnett shot back. You're the one who drove him away. I mean, who'd want to stay in the same room with a gun crazy nut? Hey, at least I'm not some techno geek. The doctor would be more comfortable with somebody he has more in common with. What would a gun nut like you know? Hey. I spent two whole days with him on that planet. And I happen to know a few more things about him than you. That's a whole lot more than you've spent with him in eight months. I guess you forgot about the time you started a mutiny and had him thrown in the brig. That was five months ago. And besides... He forgave me and we're really good friends now. I still think he'd be better off sharing my quarters. We'll see which place he wants to stay at when we find him. Yes, we will and I'm sure Razor will choose my room. H.H. More than eight months and you don't even know Dwero's nickname. Barnett gloated. I would have known it. Eventually. Perfect insisted, though she was a bit embarrassed that Barnett knew something more intimate about the Dokotra than she did. As the two girls continued to bicker, they did not know that their quarry was closer than they thought. Clinging closely to the ceilings, pipes and support beams, Dwero McFile kept as still as possible until the engineer and dread pilot passed by and turned around the corner. He silently thanked Slade for teaching him that trick of cling to the ceiling and hope no one looks up. It was a silly name, but it did have its uses. Now he was wishing that Slade would teach him how to deal with females who are fighting each other, with him as the prize. Unfortunately, Slade had no idea how to deal with that situation. Meanwhile, Galeon was getting a strange feeling as he led his squadron of scout ships on patrol around the sector. Ever since meeting Slade and the crew of the Nirvana, the inhabitants of Mission Delta-6 had been guarding themselves against any future harvester attacks. So far, there had been the occasional raid by cube fighters and perhaps one or two seed ships, but Tecumon Phantom and the newly formed defense groups had been able to beat them back thanks to some technology that had been lent to them by the female pirates. In addition to the tachyon communicators and taric food rations, 
the mission it had received several essential components and weaponry. Now they were able to better defend themselves from the Earth forces. Recently, however, the harvester raids had been less frequent and the patrol groups would rarely come across a single cube fighter or any other kind of Earth vessel. It was if the harvesters had suddenly become extinct. Viperson had been getting worried about this lull in action from the enemy. It would be too easy to lower one's guard. As he piloted his one-man craft through space, he began to wonder if the Earth was planning something big. It wasn't like the harvesters to be inactive for this long. Everyone knew how desperate they were for human organs and would stop at nothing to get them. So where were they? Just then, his long-range scanners began picking up something on the edge of the sector's periphery. He signaled for his wingmen to follow as he headed toward them. He began readying his crystal, just in case. When came close enough for his sensors to give him a visual on the object, his eyes widened in surprise. The thing looked like a seed ship, but it appeared to be more organic, and was much larger than normal. Its surface colored differently and looked as if it was coated in a jelly-like substance. The exterior was translucent and if one could get close enough, one could see several large, dark amorphous masses. It was if one was looking at a group of developing embryos though a sonogram. Galeon's feeling of foreboding increased as his group came closer, then he ordered them to hold their distance from it. Something wrong, very wrong. It was at that moment that the strange craft suddenly turned its face toward the group, as if it had just sensed their presence. The large slit on its front opened up and released the contents of the seed ship in putrid sprays of fluid and pus. That was when the carnage began. The engineering section of the Nirzana. Parfait entered her office in a half. After searching futilely for the object of her affection, and Barnett's, the engineer decided to work off some of her frustration with her latest projects. After that last battle with the harvesters, and the subsequent transformation of Jura, Dida and Mia into Tekamen, the bespectacled girl who had been thinking of new weapons for the three in order to augment their extraordinary abilities. Jura and Dina had requested Parfait to build them each a Tekabot, just like Pegas. Though that would be the most logical solution, there were some problems. First of all, Pegas was a one-of-a-kind machine and Parfait wasn't all that sure as to how it was created in the first place, when the Pixies imploded and created the Nirzana. She had found the altered vanguard shortly after that event and it had only modified it to suit Slade. There were just too many variables to consider in order to try and duplicate the process on three more vanguards. The second problem was of course, Mia's inherent claustrophobia. She didn't feel any of it in her transformed state but she still disliked being inside a van type. That would most certainly affect her performance. So the brown-haired girl had decided on an alternative measure. Since the girls had formerly been dread pilots, then they would be more comfortable in something that was related with dreads. As a result, she had her salvage teams collect every remaining scrap of debris that had been their fighters. 
most of their pixies enhanced dreads had been remade into their new Tecumon armored suits, but there were some mechanisms and components that had been left over from their unexpected metamorphosis. Surprisingly, the remnants had survived the destruction of the Harvester battle cruiser and Parfait supposed that it was due to the fact that they still retained certain properties of the Pixies. Currently, the parts that had been salvaged were being integrated into new hulls and leftover parts from the Dread Maintenance Base and the Register. In a few days, the new weapons would be ready for testing. Parfait had also gotten an idea to build a new kind of weapons system for the Warrior Squadron. The Vanguards were good and highly versatile, but they still lacked the raw firepower and mobility that Slate and the other Tekkenen had. Tecumon Saber had proven just how inferior they were against someone like him. The pirates needed something that could at least give the Vanguard pilots more of a chance of survival. To that end, she had been working on a new kind of mecha, in which the prototype was being prepared in a separate hangar. The thing resembled a Vanguard, but was small almost human-sized. It would be propelled by a new Zetron reactor, which would also power a cannon that was mounted on its right shoulder. Zetron was a very rare, but powerful energy crystal that the women of Midgley had discovered on their world when they colonized it. It had some similarities to the Pixies and Parfait had theorized that it could be used to create a weapon system that was similar to Slade's armor. Parfait still couldn't create a Tecumon, so she was going to try for the next best thing, which was to give the pilot a suit of technological armor. Slade sighed as he set up his temporary quarters in one of the old storage areas of the Nirvana. Since this had been formerly the Ikazuchi, which had once been a colony vessel, the area he was in was piled with artifacts from a century ago and was a bit dusty. He had to do a bit of cleaning before he could settle in. As he was about to lie down on the makeshift hammock he had constructed, the bat alert went off. The enemy had come. What the hell are these things? A pilot screamed out as he and his comrades were being cut down by these huge alien monsters. The defenders of Delta-6 were totally unprepared when the mutated seed ship opened up and released odd-looking lumps like organic meteors. However, when they unfolded themselves into their true forms, the pilots immediately realized that this was no joke. These types of spider crabs were winged and were surprisingly nimble for their ungainly size. Instead of energy blasts, they spewed globules of toxic goo from their mouths, which corroded and ate away at all kinds of metals, including the mission's defensive fighters. Wave after wave of the hideous Radom Enforcers blasted through the defensive ranks and headed toward the mission station. More spider crabs were launched from the seed ship in their compressed forms and hurtled toward Delta-6. However, many of them would not reach their target as Tecumon Phantom darted about like the maddened dragonfly and picked them off. The armored warrior pushed himself to his limits to prevent the attackers from getting to the innocent people aboard the station. As he thought in a near berserk rage, he felt a kind of chilling familiarity with these strange beings, which made the harvesters look tame by comparison. They were brute and absolutely merciless. 
despite the heavy casualties being inflicted by Galeon, they continued to press the attack. Phantom became more concerned as many got past him and started to attack the station. The mission's defense systems opened up as a protective barrier appeared. Defensive droids swiveled and elevated to begin tracking their targets. Laser blasts and cannon shots were fired at the spider crabs as the people desperately tried to fend off this new and deadlier foe. The monsters of the raven shrugged off direct hits as if they were nothing. They began pounding against the force field, straining it to its limits. In less than 30 seconds, they breached through the barrier making large gaps in it, which allowed more of their brethren through. The spider crab missiles streaked through the holes and uncurled themselves. These spider crabs were of the normal terrestrial variety and landed heavily on the hull of the station. Using their massive claws and mandibles, they began tearing into the reinforced bulkheads as if they were tinfoil. Liz, we can't stop them. They're whipping us apart. Patch cried out as his computer displayed the tactical readouts of the station's defense systems. One by one, the defensive armaments were being destroyed and hull breaches were showing up on several levels. The leader of the station gasped as she witnessed her home being torn up and shredded like tissue paper. In a matter of minutes, the spider crabs would break into the vital areas of the mission, namely the main reactor core and the residential areas. Once that happened, what will it take to stop these things? Her answer came in the form of Takamon Phantom as he swooped down and began cutting the spider crabs to pieces. He slashed with his stake sword and tore through the ranks of the Raven monsters. He dispatched his enemies with deadly precision and speed, giving the station's defenders time to regroup and counterattack. However, there was a problem. A worm. No. I must be nearing my time limit. Galeon felt his consciousness begin to slip away as the dark side of his Tecumon powers started to emerge. He desperately tried to hold on, as he and the remaining defensive fighters pushed to herd their enemies into one area so that he could finish them off before he lost control completely. He almost gave in to the dark desires of his raven given powers as he saw the spider crabs begin to breach the main reactor room. But, when he was given the signal that the enemy was in position and everyone was clear, he began powering up his strongest weapon. Sections of his shoulder epaulet slid away, revealing energy collectors. Parts of his leg armor also opened up. Energy crackled between the units and convalesced into one massive sphere of power. Then finally, Phantom, G-O-L-D-E-K-K. The energy suddenly winked out from Zeg and it looked as if Galeon's attack had failed. However, a heartbeat later, the spider crab suddenly exploded like flies caught in a flamethrower's blast. It was as if they were being blown away by a beam of power. An invisible beam. Apparently, Tecumon Phantom's greatest weapon could also be hidden from sight. Meanwhile, Mia, Tida and Jura ran toward the nearest airlock to join up with Slate and Pegas. Since the new weapons that Parfait was designing were not ready yet, they would have to fight on their own, alongside the white Tecumon and his robotic partner. 
Slade nodded as he saw the three girls head toward him with their crystals in their hands. All three nodded as they held their crystals aloft. Simultaneously they all cried out. In two seconds, four streaks of colored light flashed out from the Nirvana and into the star-studded void. However, as the Tekkaman Quartet joined the Vanguard and Dread Squadrons, they would soon find themselves in more trouble than the Harvesters ever gave them. That was when they came across them. Mission Delta-6. Galeon was breathing hard and was quite shaken as he had just barely managed to transform back to his human form. He had cut it close, to close. Another five seconds, and he would have succumbed to the violent and destructive urges of his radium-derived abilities. Taking several calming breaths, he departed the station's airlock and headed toward the control center. However, all was not well as he entered despite the fact that the attack had been beaten back. The consoles were lit with various damage and casualty reports. Sirens were blaring all over the place and the crews manning their equipment were in a state of near panic. The spider crabs had been destroyed, but they had already fatally crippled the station. Internal fires were burning all over. System-wide malfunctions ran all over. Most importantly, the main reactor core had been breached and a massive implosion was imminent. All they could do was slow the chain reaction for as long as they could. Liz and Patch were desperately directing the civilians to the escape shuttles, which had been built for just such an emergency. Mission Delta-6 was dying. Galeon quickly began aiding the people in evacuating the station. They only had a few minutes before their home was destroyed forever. People crowded into their only means of escape, taking their most cherished possessions and supplies. Fortunately, the entire cargo of nutrient pills they had received from the Nirvana was loaded on board, as well was whatever food and medicine. As the last of the inhabitants boarded the shuttles, the entire mission shook as the reactor core approached final meltdown. The insides became wrecked with heat and explosions as the station went into its death throes. Sections were blown from the main body and bulkheads crumbled under intense pressure. As the last of the escape shuttles broke away and headed out into space, Mission Delta-6 finally died. The mission rumbled and its surface became twisted as internal explosions tore its interior apart. Then in one massive explosion of light, the station disappeared from sight. The energy shockwaves its demise caused rocked, the escaping ships as they made their way into the star-studded void. And so the random invasion of the cosmos had begun. What are these things? Jura cried out as she just barely evaded a swarm of spider crabs. She had been expecting along with the rest of the Nirvana crew, to be going up against cube fighters and other Earth vessels. However, as soon as the mutated seed ships opened up and released their forces, the rules had completely changed. The spider crabs were tough, extremely tough. The amount of firepower needed to destroy Earth ships proved to be less than sufficient in penetrating their thick armored cells. In many cases, laser blasts were reflected away and missile hits and cannon shots were simply shrugged off. 
The monsters were all so surprisingly agile, despite their size. But most of all, they were tenacious, far more so than their harvester predecessors. The Dreads and the Vanguard pilots soon realized that their new opponents were not going to be as simple to defeat as the automated machines of the Harvesters. Though the monsters did have about the same intelligence as those pre-programmed robots, they did not have the directive to harvest human body parts. Their only directive was to destroy. Barnett gritted her teeth as she received word that the Vanguard and Dread Squadrons were taking more casualties. Since Mia and Jura no longer flew Dreads, the responsibility of leading the fighters had been regulated to her. This new enemy acted nothing like the Cube fighters, so the old tactics for dealing with them were useless. They began swarming toward the Nirvana, and even with Bart's guns blasting away, the spider crabs continued their assault on the pirate vessel. Many crashed headlong into the ship's protective barrier, straining the defenses to their limits. Several managed to penetrate through the shields and began ripping into the hull. They would have torn into the ship and destroyed it as they had Delta-6, if it weren't for four armored figures. Slate and three female techmen immediately came down on the Nirvana's hull as soon as they saw the spider crabs begin breaking into it. Using their newly given abilities and slave straining, Mia, Jura and Bida did their best to try and exterminate this infestation before they overran the crew within. He had ordered Pegasus to support the Dreads, while he, Diamond, Sapphire and Ruby defended the Nirvana. Slave landed in the midst of a group of Raven monsters and started slashing and thrusting with his weapon. Like Tecumon Phantom, he too had felt a kind of familiarity with these horrors, but pushed such thoughts away as he concentrated on eliminating them before they caused irreparable damage to the Nirvana. Soon the hull of the ship became littered with broken shells, dismembered claws and the innards and body fluids of the beasts. It was a gory sight, but it had to be done if they were to survive. Many spider crabs exploded like fluid-filled balloons when hit, splattering the metal skin of the pirate vessel with their insides. Those who were watching from within the ship, found very hard to keep from losing their lunch at the gruesome display. One crew member in particular, decided that something had to be done and began racing toward a hangar where a certain project was being developed. You, gross. Ida cried out as her energy arrows pierced through the body of a spider crab, causing streams of fluid and organs to come spewing out. Some of it landed on the front of her armor, making her shiver in disgust. Just keep fighting. Mia ordered as she ducked under the claws of another spider crab, then drove her spear into its softer underbelly. With supreme effort, she hefted the massive creature above her and slung it toward two more that were charging toward her position. Her organic projectile crashed into its brethren, and that's when Tecumon Diamond launched a volley of her armor-piercing energy darts. The tiny slivers pierced the heads of her targets, destroying their primitive brains and causing their craniums to explode. Though she was more battle-hardened than Sapphire, she too was becoming a bit nauseous over the sight of so much gore. However, 
It was the only way to defeat such a relentless enemy. Streaking above them, Hakamon Ruby was using hit and run tactics at the spider crabs. She kept streaking in and out of the enemy ranks, delivering quick slashes with her sword. Though the monsters reminded her of her old Tekadred, they were just too gross for her to want to get close to any of them. She hoped that this battle would be over soon, as she began to feel the effects of exhaustion. She was going to need a seven-course dinner once this was done. Slade noted that the performance of his comrades was beginning to decline as the battle continued. He knew that they were still new to using their Tekamon abilities for any extended periods of time, and were rapidly depleting their stores of energy. They had to finish off this conflict quickly. However, he was at a loss of how to do so. He was used to fighting machines that were pre-programmed with specific patterns. The spider crabs were erratic and unpredictable and their numbers seemed to be endless. It was at that moment that he and the other techmen realized that they were being surrounded by the spider crabs. The monsters began concentrating on eliminating their greatest opponents and attacked them in mass A. Juro was shot down as a trio of spider crabs managed to blindside her. She landed hard on the hull of the nears on a near slate as Dida and Mia were forced back. Soon, they were all herded together as the Raven creations continued their assault. It seemed that the four would be crushed by sheer numbers. Slade was preparing to go to his blaster mode, but he was already feeling tired and was uncertain if he would be able to transform. His armor began to take more hits as he and the three former Dread pilots prepared to make their last stand. Then, just as the spider crabs were about to unleash their full fury on them, a miracle appeared. Everybody duck. Hearing the voice, the four techmen took cover as a sudden blast of emerald energy appeared and took out several of the beasts, causing them to disintegrate and giving them more breathing room. Then they saw their unexpected savior as she jetted across the hull of the pirate ship. Here we go. Parfait cried out as she piloted the new prototype Tekka suit she had been working on. She hadn't had time to properly test her new invention, but decided to give it a trial by fire. She was pleased to see that the new Zetron reactor and quantum energy cannon were working properly, but she had to choose her shots carefully since she only had a limited amount of ammunition. The armor was bulkier than Slade's, but gave her good mobility and protection against the Raven creatures. The shoulder-mounted cannon fired off quantum energy shells, which proved to be sufficient in piercing the monster's heavily armored carapaces. She also had a smaller side arm which used for more pinpoint shots. Parfait was usually not one to enjoy being in the heat of battle, but she did find it to be quite exhilarating. She continued to zigzag around the spider crabs, blowing them left and right as the techmen began their counterattack. The Nirvana was quickly being relieved of its giant pest problems. Dozens of spider crabs fell to the awesome firepower of Parfait's new armor as her allies started to gain the upper hand. However, as they began to push their enemies back, Parfait's console lit up with some warning lights. 
her ammunition was getting low and the reactor was starting to overheat. She mentally chided herself for not installing any backup power sources. Then her mechanism started to malfunction, causing the armor to swerve erratically. When a couple of spider crabs charged at her, Parfait tried to evade them by veering off to the right, but one of her maneuvering thrusters misfired, causing her to tumble end over end. The armor landed hard on its back and skidded for several meters before coming to a halt. Parfait groaned and realized that in her haste to help the others, she had neglected to don the special impact absorbent flight suit that all Vanguard pilots now wore. As a result, she now had a very sore body and a few scrapes. As she shook her head to clear it, a spider crab suddenly loomed above her and raised one of its clawed legs. She quickly brought up her cannon and pulled the trigger. But... Click. Click. Oh no. I'm out of ammo. Perfect realized that without a loaded weapon, her armor was nothing more than a fancy metal spacesuit. She made a mental note to include some melee weapons and more ammunition, provided she survived. Fortunately, she would live to make those improvements as Tecumon Diamond came in from above and drove her spear into the monster's neck. Parfait grimaced as the spider crab's fluid splashed onto her armor's torso and helmet, but it was better than the alternative. The monster let off a groan and toppled off to one side. Mia leapt off its back and went to help her fallen comrade. Thanks to Parfait's last-minute rescue, Slade, Ruby and Sapphire were able to force the remaining spider crabs off the near Zana and herd them toward the others that were engaged with the dreads and vanguards. As soon as they were in position, they signaled for their allies to break off. In that moment, Slade's shoulder units flipped up. Jura and Bida followed suit and began powering up. Then they unleashed their final assault. D-O-L-T-E-K care. Scatter. D-O-L-T-E-K care. Blaster. The three separate blasts combined into one massive beam which vaporized the last of the spider crabs and their seed ships. The crew of the Nirvana all breathed collective sighs of relief as their enemies were obliterated. It was over. For now. The sick day. Now. Now. Perfect winced as her arm was being treated for a sprain. Forgive me. Perfect. Duero said as he added some soothing lotion and made certain that she had no broken bones. His gentle touch made the engineer calm down and feel a warmth as he continued to treat her injuries. That's okay. Perfect said as she blushed a bit at the contact of his hands on her arm. He was so caring and considerate. I guess it was my fault for not wearing a suit. Yes, well I certainly hope that you would refrain from such reckless actions in the future. Duero advised firmly, then his expression became a bit softer. Although, I was most impressed by the bravery you showed today. You were. She said as her eyes lit up with hope. Yes. Slade and the others would also like to thank you for your help today. They quite certain that if it weren't for you, we'd all be finished by now. Dog, oh, it was nothing. Perfect waved off, though she hoped that her actions had scored her some points with the Tarek physician. 
there was still the matter of the doctor not having a place to stay. Standing near the door to the sick bay, Barnett growled a bit as she watched the doctor continue to treat her biggest rival. She had to admit that the bespectacled girl had indeed done well and that Barnett would have to try harder in the future in order to remain serious competition. Earth. Paracon grumbled as he had received the transmissions concerning the outcomes of the battles between his forces, and those of Mission Delta-6 and the Nirvana. Though the mission had been destroyed, the inhabitants had escaped and were still considered a threat, though not as great as the one posed by the pirates and their four techmen. He had hoped that his spider crabs would have inflicted some heavy losses on the Nivana, but the females now seemed to have a new weapon. If that was the case, then the Raven would have to revise their plans and take out that accursed fleet and his comrades, but what to use? As if answering the Raven or Lord's unspoken question, the Red Pixies began humming and showed images of past battle records of the Harvesters. Tarkon snorted as he saw those failures, the Tekadred clones. What good are these? They had already proven to be worthless against Slade and the Nirvana. Why would I want to bother with making more of these Harvester failures? The Red Pixies hummed even more insistently as it telepathically began making suggestions. A minute later, the Raider Morlord chuckled evilly as he understood the Pixies' plan. Ah, so that's your plan, is it? I must admit, that it does raise possibilities. Very well. We shall proceed with this plan. And it's a good thing that we have the perfect Tekamon for the job. At that moment, a crimson armored figure entered Tarkon's private chambers and knelt down in front of his lord. Hello Saber. Have you completely recovered from your last encounter with the accursed Slade? Yes, Lord Tarkon. The Scarlet Tekamon replied. How may I serve you? I have a little job for you. To be continued. Author's notes well, that's it for part one. Stay tuned for part two as a couple of the Nears Monochrome members will play a major part in the upcoming story arc and... Dog, oh, that would be telling. Asterisk Chapter 16 Asterisk Chapter 7 Part 2, Preparations and Plan. TKK88 The Second Stage Disclaimer, Tecumon Blade, Ranma One Half and Vandred all belong to someone else, so I think you can dope out the rest. Thoughts Chapter 7 Part 2 Preparations and Plans You Want. Gross. Pilai grimaced as she was instructed by Dwero to seal up a deep wound. Her hands trembled as she held the tissue fusion applicator near the bloody, fusing. Suddenly, the pulse monitor started emitting various warning sounds, causing the apprentice nurse to lose her concentration. The young girl started to panic as the pulse meter showed an erratic heart rate, and the patient began to twitch and spasm on the operating table. Pilate's body locked up and her heart stopped for a moment as she found herself at a total loss of what to do. Then her confidence plummeted as the pulse meter showed a flat line. A few moments later, the instrument declared the patient as clinically deceased. Cause of death, a cerebral hemorrhage from a ruptured cranial vessel, 
an event that could have been prevented if Pyrae had sealed the damaged artery in time. The twelve-year-old bowed her head in shame and helplessness as the simulation ended. Behind her, Puero sighed and shook his head as he marked down Pyrae's performance on a clipboard. The final grade was of course, a complete failure. That test wasn't fair. Pyrae complained as she and the good doctor reviewed her latest performance at surgical techniques. I was just about to seal it up, but... Puero gave the girl a stern expression while pointing his index finger at her. First rule of surgery, Pyrae. You have to be ready, because anything can happen which can make even the most routine procedures more complicated. You followed the correct steps in your attempt to seal up that artery, but you neglected to monitor the patient's vital signs and adjust for any discrepancies. Furthermore, in a process as vital as this, speed is of the essence. You hesitated too long and once the patient began going into anaphylactic shock, you did nothing to stabilize his condition. But it all happened so suddenly and... And you must expect things like that to happen, especially in a combat situation. Remember, Pyrae, the patients are counting on you to pull them through. Sending them to the jacuzzi is no longer an option. Pyrae gave the turret man a bow as she looked back at the instruments and devices. I don't even know why I'm doing this. We've got all this equipment and stuff and you had me cutting people open and... and nothing. Puero stated firmly. You should consider yourself fortunate that you have all of this Majli technology to aid you. However, all of this technology doesn't mean a thing if you do not know the principles of being a physician, and know how those principles are applied. And you will find yourself in situations in which all you have is what's in here. He tapped her forehead with an index finger. Back on Derek, all medical trainees go through a final exam, in which they have to save a critically injured patient with minimal technology. I had to perform an emergency transfusion and an appendectomy with some plastic tubing and a pocket knife. Pyrae winced again as she imagined Puero performing such crude operations. The head doctor of the nears on the side again as he looked over the results for the last week. So far, Pyrae's overall medical skills were more likely to kill the crew before this new enemy did. Puero wondered just what kind of medical treatment women receive John Majli. Surely they must know all the basics of health care, right? Or did they rely completely on their technology to keep them in good health? If Pyrae's medical knowledge was any indication, then heaven help them if their medical machines should fail them. He was beginning to understand why Magno and her crew had abandoned their way of life on their home planet and became pirates. And he could also understand why the pirates had accepted his expertise. John Derek, the men were expected to make do with what they had, and their world was totally unforgiving. They had to adapt and be more creative. If a device wasn't there, then they would improvise. Rudimentary skills and knowledge were maintained and remembering the basics was a must. So why didn't a medical trainee like Pyrae know the normal ranges of vital signs? So I trust the training is going well. 
Magnolaskashi and the good doctor were conversing in the conference chamber. Well, the emergency first aid sessions are showing some promising results, Duero said as he took a sip of coffee. The Vanguard and Dread pilots are grasping the basics of CPR, setting broken limbs and dressing wounds. However, however, Pilati, the elderly woman gasped. The male doctor sighed as he nodded. I'm afraid that Pilati's knowledge and skills are somewhat lacking. Please, tell me the truth. Magna Breast, are you certain you want to know? We're talking about the well-being of my crew, doctor. Very well then. I fear that Pilati's lack of confidence, knowledge and experience will have detrimental effects on the crew in the near future, especially with this new enemy that we're now facing. Duero shuddered at the thought of the near-constant attacks that the Nirzana had been receiving in the last week. Casualties had been increasing as of late and Duero had been hard-pressed to keep up with the growing number of patients. As a result, he had been requesting that more medically trained individuals be present to deal with the situation. To that end, he had been teaching the combat pilots in emergency first aid and especially piloty. There had to be another surgeon and general physician on the ship, if something were to happen to him. He was not going to repeat the mistake as the pirates had done with Mia, and not train a backup. Since Pilai was the only other crew member with any considerable medical training, it would have to fall on her to treat the rest. You're asking an awful lot of her. Magna Blond out. She is still a child. I am aware of that. Duero affirmed. However, we must keep in mind that I will not be on the Nirvana forever, and should I be unable to perform my duties, then at least the crew will have someone to fall back on. I am well aware of the unpleasant aspects of my position, but if she is to treat the patients effectively, then she will have to endure them all. I may seem strict, harsh or even cruel in my teachings, but it's only because I want her to realize that this isn't a game. So far, she hasn't even passed the basic surgeon's tests. All new Derek trainees must complete it, before advancing to the General Medical Corps. You take your duties quite seriously, doctor. As a doctor, my patients are always first priority. The last thing a patient needs is a doctor who thinks that a soak in the jacuzzi will cure all of her problems. Pilai growled slightly as she stared at the monitor. She couldn't believe that she had to memorize all of these terms and facts into days. What was the point, especially when she could use the medical computer to look them all up? The doctor's own Mudgley did it all the time. Why was that? That man, telling her to learn all of this stuff? What was technology good for if one doesn't use it? When she was younger, she had dreamed of becoming a kind of super genius doctor and of the glamour and prestige that went with such a position. When she had been elected the pirate's chief medical officer, she had been so happy of finally attaining her dream. The others rarely complained about her performance. Then again, it wasn't as if they had much of a choice. Then he came along. Duero McFile. In no time, 
He had taken over her position as the nurse on his head physician and surgeon, and she had been regulated as his aide and nurse. The sudden demotion had made her a bit resentful, but there was no denying his skills. The crew all agreed that Puero's ability to treat their injuries and sicknesses was by far superior. Soon, they had begun to rely on him to keep them in good health. As time went on, Pyoi had decided that she could just leave the doctor in business to him. She was especially grateful of his presence. Once she had been exposed to the less pleasant aspects of being a physician. However, that left her with no direction or purpose in life. And now, Puero seemed bound and determined to make her into some kind of crude. Which doctor? Taking vital signs with a stethoscope and thermometer? Counting heartbeats and breaths manually? using two wooden slats and tape to set broken limbs. It was practically stone age, compared to the technological wonders that majorly medical science had produced in the last hundred years. Pilati shook her head again as she went back to reading the list. Earth. Do you understand the plan, Saber? You are not to destroy the Nier's honor, nor continue your vendetta against Slade. Tarkon said as he gave his Tekum on his final instructions. Saber nodded as he stood before his master in his human form. He was still somewhat perturbed that Tarkon had destroyed the Earth Council. He had wanted that pleasure of wiping out those pompous fools for all they had put him through. Perkon said slowly as he sensed the irritation in his minion. Perkon's servant nodded as he banished thoughts of anger against his lord. He knew that he couldn't stand up against a raider more lord, and he was bound to Perkon until death. Unknown to most, it was Darkon, not the Earth Council, who had orchestrated the creation of the four Tecumon of Earth. From within the Pixies, he had secretly implanted certain control devices, which would have overridden the control chips of the Harvesters. Of course, that point was now moot. Remember Saber. I need the crew of the Nier's honor to be alive. For now. He extended a hand toward Saber and a tendril emerged from his open palm. It reached out toward the Tecumon, and as Saber held out his hand, the slimy limb dropped a small object into his palm. The red Tecumon looked down at it and nodded. Will that be all, Master? For now, take lance, axe and rapier with you, as well as a few spider crabs. They should provide you with enough of a diversion. Once you have implanted this device into the Nirvana, return to base immediately. Saber didn't like the idea of being a delivery boy, but he knew of the penalty of disobeying Darkon's orders. He had wanted to ask his master about Slade's evolution to Tecumon Blaster, but Darkon would always change the subject and would not speak of it. For now, it would have to remain an unanswered question. So, Darkon had given us his orders. Rapier asked as she and her other cohorts stood in their human forms. Rapier was a slender woman with long, dark hair and green eyes. Her face was oval-shaped and her figure was quite pleasing to the eyes. However, her eyes displayed a kind of cold cruelty that would make anyone shudder with fear. She wore a simplistic blouse and skirt ensemble, 
with low-heeled humps. Hax was a shorter, but heavily muscled brute, and had short, brown hair. His face was beefy and his face seemed to be wearing a permanent sneer. His clothes consisted of a green body suit with brown boots. He was just as cold as rapier, but preferred to dispatch his foes with brute force, rather than finesse. Lance was slimmer than his cohort and he had light, lavender hair, pulled back in a utilitarian ponytail. He would be considered handsome, but one could tell he had a very nasty streak in his personality. He was cocky and vain, though he now nursed a bit of an easiness in his abilities, after his defeat at the hands of Tecumon Blaster. He was the classic bully. He wouldn't hesitate to gloat and pick on the weak, but he would turn tail and flee whenever his opponent gained the upper hand. If it weren't for his cruel streak and lethal style, Tarkon would have considered him as useless. Saber growled a bit as he nodded to Rapier's question. He hated the others and held only contempt for them. Personally, he would much rather spend his time in defeating Slade, but he had no choice in the matter. He'd promised to himself that he would eventually find out Slade's secret to evolving. If Tarkon refused to tell him, then he would just have to discover it for himself. For now, he would just have to go along with this plan. At the very least, he could cause his greatest foe some considerable pain. Tanir's honor. I'm waiting, Pylai, Duro said as he gestured to the monitor, which depicted a close-up image of damaged tissue. Okay. I know this one. The young girl assured as she gazed upon the image. She snapped her fingers as she replied. I got it. That's a second-degree burn of cardiac muscle. What? What do you mean? First of all, this is most definitely not part of the heart. Duero zoomed out the image, which depicted. The young girl blushed furiously as she saw what it was. You. That's a man's. Duero said simply, then gave her a stern expression. What? Did you think that you were going to treat just women aboard this ship? What are you going to do if Slade, myself or Bart get injured? Do you think you won't encounter other male patients in the future? A doctor must know both sides of the gender line. I had to learn from scratch about female anatomy when I signed on as the ship's physician. Male or female, it doesn't matter. They're all patients to a doctor. Pylai was still a bit unnerved at the sight of a man's censored, that she just barely managed not to lose her lunch. She became relieved when Duero changed the image. Just then, the bat alert went off. In less than a heartbeat, Four human comets streaked out from the Nirvana, followed closely by the Dread and Vanguard squadrons. Everyone braced for the latest radom assault as dozens of spider crabs advanced toward the pirate vessel and its defenders. As the beasts began engaging, a certain quartet watched the battle closely from within a mutated seed ship. HMMM, so far they're following their usual attack patterns. Rapier observed as she gestured to the ship's main monitor. Yes, it shouldn't be too much of a problem to place the device. Axe agreed. Saber merely growled as he still did not like the idea of being reduced to that of a delivery drone. 
If it were that simple, then he could have just let those mindless spider crabs do the job. At that moment, Lance plonked out something new on the monitor. Hello? What do we have here? The spider crabs were given quite a surprise when some of the vanguards suddenly opened up and released smaller versions of themselves. The few tech suits that Perfect had managed to get operational, now showed their worth as they began working in concert with their larger counterparts. Sean could put her new tech suit through a few evasion maneuvers, easily slipping through the ranks of the spider crabs. She began blasting away with her shouldered cannon, while her remote-controlled vanguard laid down covering fire. She felt a kind of exhilaration as she moved about like Slade and the other techmen. Her new armor had enough firepower to bring down a small cruiser and with this added mobility, she felt as if she could take on the universe. Fighting nearby, her cohort, Yukio the XDII, was also finding her new tech suit to be quite a wonder weapon. She had been envious of Dina, Chura and Mia's ability to become techmen, but now this was something which allowed her to experience what it was like to fly freely through space and possess considerable power. As she streaked down toward another group of spider crabs, she disengaged her cannon and reached behind for the special melee weapon she had perfect devised for her. She whipped out a technological version of her family's battle spatula and activated it. The flat edge of the weapon glowed with Zetron energy as she slashed through the armored shells of her opponents. HMMM, it seems they've come up with some would-be techmen, Saber remarked as he watched their forces being decimated by Slade and his allies. HMPF. As if those tin cans could even compare to true techmen. Ray Deer scoffed as she held out her tech a crystal. Why don't we show them just what Techman can really do? Slade shouted out as four new players came onto the scene. Currently, he was without Pegas as the Techabot was undergoing a few modifications. Ruby, Diamond and Sapphire were caught off guard as Axe. Lance and Rapier came upon them for a long-awaited rematch. As Slade started toward them to assist, he was suddenly blindsided by an old enemy's lance, which struck him hard in the back. When he turned about, his eyes widened, then narrowed. He growled. I had a feeling that you were still alive. Oh yes. Saber replied with a sneer as he also readied for the imminent conflict, despite his orders not to engage his archenemy. Alive. And killing. With those words, the two charged at each other. Their lances clashed together as they continued to stare each other down. You didn't think something as trivial as Planetary Armageddon would be enough to destroy me, did you? Saber taunted. Slade growled as he pushed back and then jetted backward to get in a better position, before going at it again. As he engaged his opponent, he started to get a strange feeling that something was different about Saber this time around. Mia gritted her teeth from behind her helmet as she found herself up against Axe again. Though her battle skills as a Tekamon had improved since the last encounter, she was still at a disadvantage in overall brute power against the Raven Berserker. 
She tried a zigzag flight pattern while firing off a barrage of her energy darts. However, Hax easily defended by spinning his weapon about like a baton, deflecting the projectiles with the flat of his blade. Not this time. Hax sneered as he countered with a savage slash, which let loose with a sizzling arc of energy. Mia winced as she barely managed to avoid the blast, which nicked her left flank. Then, before she could retaliate, Hax was suddenly in front of her and delivered a fist directly into her gut. Her armor wasn't enough to protect her fully from the impact and she felt as if her stomach was being pounded into her spine. Hax smiled as he swung his weapon about, smacking Diamond around with the blood end. He wasn't going to kill her outright. That would be too quick. He wanted to soften her up a bit before separating her head from her shoulders. It would make a nice trophy to present to Lord Darkon. Not you again. Jura snarled as she faced off against Rapier with blade drawn. Rapier was especially eager to mix it up with this blonde would-be Tecumon Floozy. She had been shamed by this novice and wanted to pay her back for all the humiliation a hundredfold. It's time we separated the Tekumen from the Wanabes. Tida cried out as she jetted across space with Lance hot on her tail. She had tried to use her energy bow against him, but he simply deflected her arrows with his own weapon. He also fired back at her with his shouldered cannons, giving her even more to worry about. She had to lead him away from her comrades, as he was firing without any regard of whom or what was nearby. He had already obliterated several spider crabs that had gotten in his way and Sapphire was certain that he would destroy without any remorse any dreads or vanguards to get at her. For a lance, he was enjoying the chase immensely. He could tell that Dino was the least experienced of the new Tekumen. He could almost smell her fear. It was only a matter of time before he caught up with his prey. Then the fun would begin. Slade was thrown back hard and crashed against a group of spider crabs. The monsters were pulverized in the impact, but they did serve to stop his momentum. The white Tekamon shook his head and looked down at his chest, which now sported a wicked gash in the armor. He looked back up and just managed to avoid being skewered as Saber dug down with his weapon extended. He brought up his own lance and managed to turn away Saber's but the Crimson Tecumon turned around and sent a hard kick to Slade's left temple. Slade was unable to block in time and was sent sprawling. The Nirvana. What does it take to destroy Saber? BC said in disbelief. Like many of the crew she had believed that he had perished on that desert world. To see him again unnerved even the normally cool first mate. Commander. Something's wrong. Emma Roden said as she looked at her console's readout. What is it? PC asked as she walked over to her position. I've been monitoring the battle between Slade and Saber, and it looks like Saber is emitting more bioenergy than previously recorded. What do you mean? Saber's overall output has increased by more than 37%. Slade is getting pounded. Magno nodded as her expression became more serious. 
It seems that Saber has been spending some time in the gym since we last encountered him, and it's not paying off. She turned toward the navigation well. Bart, can you give our forces some support? Negative, Captain. The bald navigator replied sadly. The enemy is too close to our own forces. I can't get any clear shots. Besides, it's taking all I've got to keep the shields up and stop those monsters from ripping up the hull again. Why doesn't Slade transform? Celtic cast. Magno shook her head. I'm afraid that he's still occupied with Saber and he can't risk using that Megavolticker with our dreads and vanguards engaging those things. Slade groaned as he picked himself up after crashing into another group of spider crabs. He once again faced off against Saber, and though he couldn't see his expression, the former Shodom could tell that his foe was enjoying every minute of this fight. Since when could Saber hit that hard? At last Haymaker had a lot more kick than I remembered. Let me guess, Saber. You've been working out, haven't you? Saber chuckled evilly as he twirled his lance. Not quite. I was in terrible shape when we last saw each other, but a stint in the regeneration pods can do wonders for a Tekamon. Regeneration pods? Saber chuckled even louder. Oh yes, that's right. You don't know about my new boss. Boss? You mean, the harvesters? Oh I don't mean those organ hungry weaklings. They are no longer your concern or anyone else. Did you really think they could create the spider crab hordes of the Raven? Spider crabs? Raven? Slade felt a chill going down his spine as he remembered back to when he had spoken to Galeon Viper Son. Tecumon Phantom had told him of the ancient race of warmongering aliens that had created the Tecumon power process. You mean? Oh yes. The Raven shall rise again. And Lord Tarkon shall destroy all who stand in his way. Yes, and I hope you will remember that name. And mine. Once I send you to oblivion. With those words, Saber started slashing away at his target with a ferocity and speed that Slade found hard to counter. His foe had definitely gotten much faster and stronger than before. He wanted to transform into his evolved form, but Saber wasn't giving him any time to attempt it and there was his allies to consider as well. With so many dreads, vanguards, Tekka suits fighting nearby, he couldn't consider using his enhanced powers. At the moment, he would have to hold out as he was. For Saber, he was enjoying himself. Right now, he had the edge since he didn't have to worry about hitting any friendly forces. The spider crabs were nothing more than cannon fodder and were considered expendable. As for his fellow techmen, well they were just associates and would be disregarded once their fullness was over with. Slade was feeling the pain that he suffered ever since they met and Saber was going to Saber every moment. His enemy was taking hits and feeling agony with every impact. However, when he received a mental signal in the back of his head, he knew that he would have to cut his playtime short. He growled slightly as he heard Darkon's voice in his head. Saber. What are you doing? Have you forgotten your mission? No, master. I have not. 
However, I am close to defeating Slade once and for all. Currently, he had Slade in a chokehold with his lance pressing up against Slade's neck. With Saber applying pressure from behind, things began to look bleak. You all complete the mission I had given to you. Slade shall be destroyed, but only at my discretion. Or shall I remind you just who is your master? With those words, Saber began feeling a sharp pain emanating from the base of his neck and into his brain. This caused him to loosen his grip on his lance. At the instant he felt the pressure ease on his throat, Slade slammed his elbows into Saber's abdomen, knocking him back. Swinging about with his lance, Slade smacked Saber away like a baseball batter. The red tech among went flying and slammed hard against the hull of a dread fighter as it streaked by. Saber picked himself up and looked on the surface of where he had landed and smiled as he saw who was in the cockpit. Barnett thought the urge to scream as Saber loomed above her, his eyes glowing red. She began having flashbacks of that time when she had last seen the armored warrior and how close she had come to being killed. She saw images of firing her weapons at him with no effect, and how he had sent her crashing down in her vanguard. Since then, she would occasionally have nightmares about those events. And now, it seemed that Saber was going to finish the job he had started as he prepared to drive his lance into his victim. Barnett's survival instincts took over as she made her dread do a sudden rollover. This caused Saber to be knocked off balance as his lance came down. The point smashed through the canopy, but missed its intended target, Barnett's heart. The tip ripped into her console systems. The pilot winced as the blade grazed her right arm. But she had no time to consider the injury as her ship's emergency systems kicked in. With the sudden decompression, the Dreads computer activated protective shielding panels to stabilize the cockpit atmosphere and cushion the pilot. However, as Saber's lance had also damaged the fighter's navigational systems, the dread began flying erratically. Saber blasted away from his perch on Barnett's dread, ripping up the hull with a parting slash. He smiled as he watched the dread careen toward the Nirvana. Inside her fighter, Barna desperately tried to regain control of her ship, but knew that it was a losing battle. With the Nirvana filling up her main monitor, she had only one choice. Reaching out with her left hand, she grabbed hold of the ejection lever and pulled. Parts of the hull around the cockpit disengaged and flew off. The ejection module, containing the cockpit and several small maneuvering thrusters, basted free and away from the doomed ship. It immediately fired its thrusters to further distance itself from the rest of the hull. Barnett could only watch as her dread impacted hard against the Nirvana's shields and disappear in an expanding cloud of gases and debris. She then looked down at her injured right arm and shuddered at the thought of how close she come to dying. She then smiled a bit as she knew that this was a valid excuse to see Duero. In a minute, her ejection module was picked up by one of the warrior squadron pilots and was transported back to the Nirvana. However, no one knew that in addition to the injured pirate, there was an extra passenger. 
Saber's lance had not only caused the destruction of Barnett's thread, but had also deposited a certain device in its systems. Mia was feeling pain on a very intense level, but managed to hold her own against the murderous axe. She had taken quite a beating, but was starting to give back as good as she got. She hadn't endured Slade's training to be beaten by this brute. She managed to get Axe's weapon in a bind with her spear, then kicked out with her right leg, catching him in the solar plexus. She then thrust forward with her spear to skewer Axe's left shoulder. The larger space warrior howled in pain as he grabbed hold of Mia's weapon and attempted to pull it out. At the same time, he reached out with his other hand and grabbed hold of Mia's throat. She started to feel her neck being constricted, even through her protective armor. She desperately tried to free herself from her foe's grip and had to let go of her own weapon. However, even her enhanced strength was no match for the raw power of her opponent. She started to lose consciousness and had to do something quickly. As everything started to go black, she decided on a last-ditch tactic. You. Little. Axe snarled as he increased pressure. In another minute, Mia's head would pop off like a cork from a champagne bottle. Nothing can help her. D-O-L-T-E-K-K. Cut her. Her adversary took the full force of Mia's strongest weapon as she let loose with twin blasts of energy at point-blank range. Axe was taken completely by surprise as he driven back and his armor was shredded. He let off another howl of agony as he fell away from her and was lost in the confusion of the ongoing battle. Mia gasped as she drifted in space. Her body had been battered, bruised and her armor was badly damaged. However, she was still alive and that was all that mattered. The problem at the moment was that her fight with Axe had depleted all of her energy stores and she could feel the effects of total exhaustion. She needed to transform back and quickly. Luckily for her, Gascogni was flying nearby in her delivery ship and sighted her after rearming some of the dreads. The head supplier picked up the former dread leader and headed back to the Nirvana. Tecumon Ruby was reaching her limit as her duel with Rapier intensified. The two had been matching their sword skills and neither one was willing to yield. Jura began to realize that her first victory against the enemy female Tecumon had been mostly due to luck. Rapier was definitely no novice when it came to sword combat and overall ferocity, and it had already scored several hits on her opponent. Jura's armor had a few deep cuts and gashes in it and she was losing her strength rapidly. She knew that she had to finish this fight and soon. So, she decided to gamble as Rapier dived in for a lethal strike. Jura fired off her arm shield at her, but Rapier let off a laugh of scorn as she easily dodged it then drove her sword into Jura's unguarded left flank. The blonde let off a scream of utter pain as Rapier started to twist her blade. You didn't think I would fall for the same trick, did you? Rapier sneered as she enjoyed watching Jura rise in agony. However, Jura let off a small chuckle as she grabbed onto Rapier's sword with one hand and gasped. No. But I knew. That. You'd fall. 
for this trick. Rapier was about to wonder what she meant when something struck the back of her head. The sudden impact caused her to lose her grip on her sword, and that's when Jura reacted. Her shield had come back like a boomerang and caught her enemy off guard. The pirate slashed with her sword across the face of her foe, cutting into the helmet and... Jura bit down and pulled out Rapier's weapon. With adrenaline pumping, she drove her adversary's own blade into the damaged side of Rapier's helmet, causing her to scream even more. Like Hax, she fell away from Jura, giving her opponent the chance to finish her off. Jura fought back the feeling of shock as she focused her last remaining stores of energy and... D-O-L-T-E-K-K. Scatter. The blisters on her armor glowed as she thrust out her arms and let loose with a barrage of energy bolts that spread out, then came together on their target. Rapier was engulfed in a massive blast of energy, obscuring her from sight. Jura fought down the urge to throw up as she weakly jetted back to the Nirvana. Kinda knew that she was in trouble as she was knocked down by her hands. She had tried to fight back with her bow, but she was no match against her savage opponent in close quarters combat. As the Tekamon prepared to finish her off, Sapphire prayed that it would be quick. Mr. Alien. I'm so sorry. Just then, she caught sight of two figures coming up from behind her tormentor. Twin blasts of quantum energy were launched, causing Lance to pause in his execution. This gave Ida a chance to get away as Yukio and Sean let loose with all the firepower their Tekka suits possessed. Lance, however, smirked behind his helmet, as he was bombarded by a massive barrage of shots from their quantum energy cannons. The two Vanguard pilots continued to fire, and fire, and fire. For one full minute, Lance could not be seen with a naked eye. However, when Yukio and Sean Pu's weapons ran dry, they beheld a sight which made their blood run cold. When the energy blasts died down and dissipated, Lance was still there, undamaged. The Tekamon let loose with a cruel laugh, which made the two girls even more fearful. Fa 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 fa. Well, that was fun. Now, it's my turn. Before they could even blink, Lance rocketed toward them. With one swipe of his weapon, he cut into their armor as if it was made of tinfoil, causing massive damage and malfunctions. The two had no choice but to disengage from their Tekka suits before they were destroyed. Activating their ejection devices, the girls were enveloped in their space suits as their armor units were jettisoned. Their environmental suits automatically began signaling to their vanguards to pick them up, but as Lance came toward them, the two pirates knew that their machines would not make it in time. They were about to die. Lance chuckled as he came up to his helpless prey and prepared to turn them into bloody hunks of sushi. Then he heard a voice behind him. No. Leave them alone, you big bully. Lance was caught off guard as Dino launched her energy arrows at him. This time, her aim was true as the projectiles nailed the Tekamon in the back knocking him away from Sean Pugh and Yukio. As their vanguards came to pick them up, 
Sapphire breast the attack and used her a weapon to keep Lance busy as her comrades escaped. Lance laughed at his foe's pathetic attempts to fight him and swatted away each attack. Fa! As if you could ever defeat me with such weak. Hey RGH. His taunting was suddenly cut off as Dina fired off an energy arrow at point blank range, blinding Lance for a few precious seconds. She then got some distance and. D-O-L-D-E-K-K. Blaster. Lance found himself on the receiving end of Dina's final attack and was sent off like a flaming comet. Dina paused to catch her breath, then signaled for Gascogne to pick her up. She was done. Nearby, the battle between Slade and Saber was reaching its climax. Both Tekken and Ag lost their weapons and were now exchanging blows at a maddening pace. Neither one even bothered to block each other's attacks, as it boiled down to a question of who wanted to win the most. In the background, the Raider and Nears on the forces fell away to the sides as the end of the conflict was about to be decided. Slade was a millisecond to slow encountering another series of punches from Saber, causing him to be momentarily dazed. That was all the time Saber needed as he jetted backward to get some distance and shouted out in triumph. It's time I put you out of my misery. Goodbye Slade. Anti-G-O-L-T-E-K-K. The Nirvana's Tekamon had no chance to defend himself as Saber let loose with crimson bolts of energy, which engulfed his target in a blinding sphere of destruction. He could feel his damaged armor break away and his body being bathed in agony. However, as he felt himself being torn apart, a strange sensation washed over him and a thin blue aura surrounded his form. Saber felt a feeling of foreboding as he saw the outline of Slade within the field of energy. He had thought that he had finally defeated his adversary, but... No! I got him. He should be blasted into dust. What's happening? Oh, it's no. Oh, yes. The remnants of Slade's armor regenerated themselves and became more robust. His body surged with new power as the transformation to Tekamon Blaster took place. The energy around him dispersed as Slade's evolved form emerged. No. I was so close. Damn him. It's over, Saber. Blaster growled as he held out his arms and opened up his Volticore units. He began powering up as he aimed for his rival and the spider crabs behind him. Since the nears on the fighters had withdrawn, they were in no danger of being caught in the blast. Saber snarled as he began rocketing away. He knew that this battle was lost, but with his objective achieved, there was no point in remaining. Another time, Slade. Saber promised as he made his escape toward a waiting siege ship. The Radom forces desperately began their withdrawal before Blaster attacked, but only the Tekkenen and a few of their spider crabs would make it. The rest was going to be destroyed. Saber and his injured cohorts barely managed to get into the seed ship and escape into hyperspace when Blaster let loose with his strongest weapon. The hordes of spider crabs were annihilated as the blast caught them all like a raging tsunami. The entire sector of space was engulfed with the resulting energy shockwaves, and even with its shield zone full, 
Amir's mama was almost shaken to pieces. Then, as the force of the blast died out, Hekamon Blaster limped back to the ship. It was over for now. Later. How does that feel, Barnet? Duero asked as he finished bandaging up the dread pilot's arm. It feels good. Barnet replied with a small smile. How are Dinah, Jura and Mia? It was a bit touch and go for a while, but they all managed to pull through. It was partly due to their status of Tekumen. Their bodies were more resilient than I had thought and they should be fully recovered in a week or so. That's good to hear. What would we do without you? Barnett gave him a more pronounced smile. Sometimes, I wonder. Duero replied quietly. His thoughts went back to when Jura and the other Tekumen were brought in. The blonde Tekumon had suffered a ruptured spleen and a damaged liver during her fight with Rapier. The others weren't quite as injured, but also needed serious medical attention. The sight of their wounds and all that blood had made Pyrae almost totally petrified with fear and disgust. All of her training was forgotten and she had been merely useless to Duero as he worked to stabilize their conditions. The good doctor had to work overtime to see to their needs. Once he was certain that they would survive, he had given the apprentice nurses turn talking to. It was very hard for him not to lose his temper over Pyrae's inability to deal with such matters of importance. The little girl protested, saying that he was being unfair in his judgment over her recent performance. The physician, however, knew that he would have to be harsh and make Pyrae understand that this was no game. He didn't like to cause anyone pain, either physically or mentally, but he had to get her medical skills up to satisfactory levels, or else the entire crew would suffer in the near future. The doctor was brought back to reality when he heard Barnett's voice. He turned toward her, checked the dressing and nodded. Your arms should be all right in two days or so. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have three Tekumen to see you. I imagine that they're going to be very hungry once those sedatives wear off. As he got up to leave for the intensive care ward, Barnett reached out and took hold of his right wrist, stopping him. He glanced over his shoulder with a questioning gaze. Island, there anything else? Barnett did not answer immediately as she looked into the eye that wasn't covered by hair. She had grown fond of the colored hazel and to her, looking into that eye was like seeing into his soul. She could see that something was bothering the good doctor and she guessed why. Pylai had often complained in the cafeteria after her training sessions. Finally, she spoke in a gentle tone. Duero, don't be so hard on Pylai. She really is trying. How could you know about? Barnett smiled knowingly. Well, with all the time you've been spending with her and how she's been. Her voice trailed off as she recalled exactly what the apprentice nurse had called him behind his back. She phrased her next words carefully. Taking the training, it wasn't hard to figure out. It's very obvious, isn't it? Duero sighed as he sat back down. Yes, and even though Pylai doesn't show it, she really does appreciate all that you're doing for her. 
I admit that she wasn't exactly doctor material when she started taking up medical duties, but at least we all knew that she cared about us. Duero nodded and held up a hand. Oh, I'm not questioning her sincerity to her duties. That was the main reason why I'm training her. She has the potential to be a good nurse, or even a physician. The only thing is, I have to smooth out all the rough edges, and she has a lot of them. However, I think that she will be able to handle things, once I'm gone. Barnett felt a bit of regret in her heart as she realized the truth in Duero's statement. The Tarek physician would most likely return to his home world, once this crisis was over. She became a bit rueful that she had such little time to get to know him better. All those months wasted in hating Duero as a man, instead of seeing him as Duro the person. She quickly banished such sad thoughts as she leaned forward and gave him a peck on his cheek. She then quickly got up and said, Well, give Pyrae some more time. I'm sure she'll come around, Razor. As she left the sick day, Duero continued to sit and wonder. His right hand came up to stroke the place where Barnett's lips had touched. In his mind, he could hear her voice saying his nickname. With a slight smile, he got to his feet and headed toward the intensive care ward. Earth. Saber and the rest of the Tekumen were being regenerated in the Tekapods as Darkon contemplated the next step. The operation had cost him quite dearly, but the goal had been achieved. Unknown to the Nirvana and its crew, the battle had been merely a diversion. A much more insidious plan was in the works. When Saber had returned, he had been severely reprimanded for his disobedience. The Red Tecumon had protested and even demanded the secret to Slade's evolution. However, the Raider Morlord had once again refused to divulge the process and it had Saber placed in indefinite stasis until he saw fit to release him. Oh yes, Perkon knew of the penultimate form of the Tecumon. He knew of its strengths and of its weaknesses. In fact, he was certain that Slade would soon realize the price to be paid for having such power. Days later on the Nirvana, Slade was feeling quite nauseous as he left the cafeteria. He wasn't hungry as usual and those in cafeteria were quite surprised to see him leave without eating all of his food. Usually, in one sitting, he would eat enough to feed ten people. However, he had barely consumed a tenth of his meal before calling it quits. As he plodded down the hallway, he passed a by Duero and gave him a small wave. As he continued onward, Duero looked over his shoulder and became a bit concerned at the state Slade was in. Of course, he had been expecting that the Tecumon would be a little drained after transforming to his evolved form. However, this time, Slade's usual coordination was lacking and he walking as if he was being weighed down. Duero began to suspect that something was wrong, very wrong. Slade staggered into his quarters and plopped face down on his bed. As he lay on his stomach, he absently began staring at the wall. Suddenly, his eyesight momentarily blurred as everything became bathed in a red haze. A sharp pain briefly flared in his head before subsiding. The Tecumon wondered just what was happening, 
then dismissed it as merely fatigue. He reasoned that all he needed was some rest and let himself drift off to sleep. Little did he know that his condition was more serious than anyone would think. In the hangar, the remains of Barnett's fighter was recycled as a new dread was being built for Jura's friend. As the engineers worked taking apart the cockpit and installing new systems, nobody noticed a tiny, alien device that was attached to a subsystem. As one of Parfait's engineers looked up the onboard navigational computer to a terminal, the Raven device began to carry out its programming. It immediately detached itself from its hiding place and began riding the relays towards its first destination, the nearest one is Pixies. To be continued. Author's notes well, that was a long one and now we're heading into chapter 8, a three-part storyline which will entail some major changes in the storyline. As the bat against the radium heats up, these events will have some serious results. See you there. Asterisk Chapter 17 Asterisk Chapter 8 Part 1 Darkon's Plan DKK Ariadne The Second Stage Disclaimer This story is based on someone else's works, and you know the rest. Thoughts Chapter 8 Part 1 Darkon's Plan Slade, formerly known as Ranmasodom, writhed fitfully in his sleep. In his dreams, a voice was heard in his head, repeating over and over in a scornful tone. Foolish boy. You are nothing but a weakling. Where's your pride as a martial artist? Where's your honor? Stop your whining. A martial artist must be prepared to sacrifice his life for the sake of the art. But I don't want to. A young boy's replied as Slade recognized it as a younger version of himself. I am ashamed of you, boy. Oh what did I to be cursed with such a weakling? who can't even take a little harmless training. Now get in there and learn that technique. Once again, Slade saw a young boy being thrown into a dark pit. The blackness was soon illuminated by those countless multitudes of red eyes. Then, the indescribable pain and anguish began again. A minute later, Slade screamed himself awake as he fell to the floor of his quarters. Fortunately, by this time, the space had been drained of the recent flood waters and cleaned, so he landed on a dry floor. The Tecumon panted hard as he sat up. That same dream had come to him again. He found himself shivering almost uncontrollably as he began to wonder if he wasn't going mad. The force of Slade's reaction to his dream made three others aboard the Nirvana suddenly scream and drop out of their beds. On their foreheads, their symbols glowed in tune with Slade's even though he was on a different deck. Each girl wondered why they had reacted like that and then had an image of Slade in their minds. Things were getting more serious. The Nirvana's conference room. Magno nodded as she, Slade, Mia and BC were discussing the events of the past battles with their new enemy, the murderous Raven. So what you're saying is that the harvesters are no longer a threat? The aged woman asked. Slade nodded. That's what Mia and I were able to piece together from what I learned from Saber and Galeon. As far as we can tell, the harvesters are extinct. Judging from what Saber stated, I think these aliens, 
The Raven destroyed the Earth forces and took over. Mia nodded as well. It makes sense. We haven't come across a single cube fighter or any other kind of harvester ship for a while now. Those spider crabs are definitely organic in nature, judging from their remains. Perfect schemes and where we have been studying them and they have found residual circuits that resemble those found in cube fighters but arranged in patterns like rudimentary nervous pathways. It sounds so... impossible. PC stated as she looked at the holo project ions of the engineering team's findings. Are you saying that those monsters were once cube fighters? Appa. Radom are able to transform machines into living tissue? Well... Perfect and the doctor wouldn't exactly call them alive. Mia amended. Duero says that they're more along the lines of mindless drones of pseudoprotoplasm. They're like organic robots. And judging by the way this radium has been using them so far, I think they're considered as nothing more than cannon fodder. They only seem to be concerned with destroying the enemy, regardless of their losses. Magno nodded in agreement to Mia's assessment. So what you're saying is that this Raven's strategy is totally different from that of the Harvesters. PC became a little alarmed at this hypothesis. Then that means that collecting human organs is no longer an issue. Captain, do you realize what this means? The hundred-plus-year-old woman nodded. Yes. Our messages to Tarek and Mujli about the harvesters are no longer valid. That is, if they ever received them. And I severely doubt they'd believe us about the Raven. But Captain, we do have undeniable proof of their existence. Mia affirmed as she gestured to herself and to Slade. Slade, myself, Jura and Dida. She's right. Slade agreed. We're living proof of what the Raidam are capable of. We learned from Galileo that the Tecumon power process was originally created by the Raidam. And it makes sense as to how Saber and those other Tekumen were created if the Radom were behind it all. And then there's the Pixies. Yes, we could show them our Tekumen. PC suggested but was stopped as Magno held up a hand. Indeed we could, Magno interjected. But keep in mind who we are trying to convince. The governments of both Mujli and Tarek are not the most accepting of people. And seeing what a Tecumon is capable of may stir up some power struggles. I'm quite certain that there are several members of both governments who would see Slade and the others as the ultimate weapons to use against their enemies. We cannot afford to have more conflict between our two worlds, especially when we all need to be united against this newer, deadlier enemy. Yes, I suppose you're right. So where do we go from here? Slade inquired. For the time being, all we can do is continue on our way to our home systems. Whether they will believe us or not, we still must warn them of the threat. The others nodded as the meeting was concluded and they all got up. However, when Slade suddenly stumbled to the floor, they stopped and looked down at the former showdown. Slade, are you alright? Mia asked as she knelt down to help him up. Slade shook his head to clear it then nodded as he got up. It's okay. I was just clumsy. That's all. 
He brushed himself off and promptly left the room, followed by the former dread leader. Both BC and Magno stayed behind as the two exited. They had expressions of surprise and concern on their faces. Clumsy? Slade? That doesn't sound right. BC remarked. Magno agreed slowly as she wondered about him. Slade had been acting somewhat uncoordinated as of late, which was odd for someone who was skilled in the martial arts. She had seen him practice intensely almost every day and he had never displayed anything less than the grace of a jungle cat from Majli. Sometimes he would put even those felines to shame. Later, Slade grunted as he lifted a very heavy piece of machinery. However, the massive console barely made it off the floor as he staggered toward the place where Dascogni was indicating. After placing the console down, he wiped his brow and took a long, deep breath. Are you feeling all right, D-boy? The head supplier asked in concern. The Tecumon nodded as he rubbed his slightly sore arms and back. Yeah, it's nothing. I've been a little tired for a while, that's all. I guess I should have lifted with my legs, eh, Ms. Casco? Gascogne was not convinced. Last week? Slade had lifted three times as much weight without any problems. How could he have so much trouble with a mere 5,000 kilos? Still later. You're getting better, Sean Pugh. You managed to tag me a couple of times. Slade said as he helped his sparring partner up off the mat. Thanks. I think I've gotten faster. The Amazon said happily as she wiped off her sweaty forehead with a towel. Same time tomorrow, okay? Slade said as he picked up his own towel and headed back toward his quarters for a shower. And remember to always fight with honor. Sean Pu nodded as she watched him go. Then she started thinking back to her training session. She was convinced that her reflexes and overall speed had increased, but she still couldn't believe that she had actually landed some blows on him. His speed today seemed slower and some of his punches and blocks were sloppy. Had he been purposely holding back or was it something else? In his quarters... Slade held his right wrist with his left hand. In his right was a glass of water, but he was having a difficult time of keeping it steady. After a minute, his grip failed him and the glass dropped to the floor and shattered, causing the water to spill into a small puddle. Slade did not even notice the mess he had made as his sense of balance was thrown off giving him a feeling of vertigo. The room spun about before his eyes and he felt another sharp stab of pain in his head. His vision became clouded in a blood-red haze. The sensations lasted for a long minute as he thought to keep on his feet. Finally, the sensation ended as his vision cleared and the dizziness disappeared. However, Slade was left shaken and a bit drained as he wondered just what was happening to him. These sensations only started after his latest transformation to Tecumon Blaster. He wondered if they were connected, then decided to dismiss the possibility. He was only tired and fighting the radium had taken a lot out of him, that was all. Besides, he had to think about the safety of the Nirvana, and he couldn't be bothered with any other problems. Speaking of other problems, 
Perfect nodded as her latest project was nearing completion. The salvaged components of Jura, Tida and Mia's old threads were being integrated into the new systems and would soon be ready for testing. As the chief engineer of the Nirvana worked, neither she nor any members of her team noticed a certain radium device was making its way toward the interface console which was linked to the Nirvana's Pixie's core. The thing was no larger than a mote of dust and was shaped like some grotesque insect. The radium spy had been programmed to infiltrate the mainframe of the Pixie's core and was now just inches away from its goal. It had taken quite a while to travel through the miles of circuit relays and protection devices before it finally reached its destination. Once it found the correct access port, it used a special program to simply sneak its way into the heart of the pirate vessel. As it found itself within the crystalline depths of the Pixies, it then got to work. The Nirvana's Pixies was certainly corrupted from its continued interaction with these pitiful humans. The radium device deduced that the core's prolonged absence from radium influence had made it impossible to return it back to its true calling, serving its radium masters. The core resisted all attempts to subvert it and the device concluded that the exercise was futile. The spy lacked both the power and the time to force the pixies to change sides. Any continued attempts would most certainly alert the crew to its presence. The initial plan to bring the Pixies back under the control of its creators was abandoned, but the secondary plan would be carried out. Tapping into the core's memory banks, the spy started downloading certain processes and modifications to the Tecumon transformation. Once it had obtained the data it needed, the spy then exited the pixies and went to carry out the second part of the plan. The sick day. The spy found its way into Duero's console through a service port. As it made its way through the physician's security protocols, it started delving into the ship's personnel files. Every last detail of each crew member was taken in, including their physical, psychological and personal data. It sorted through everyone until it came across to particular individuals. Making more extensive calculations, it decided that these two would serve Barcon's purpose as well. After completing the data scan, the tiny device headed toward the sensor relay systems of the ship. After integrating itself into the circuitry, it scanned the routine sensor emissions that the ship normally let off. It began transmitting a tachyon carrier wave during a sensor phase. The data stream then rode its way out into space and toward its destination, the Earth. Once its mission was completed, the device activated its self-destruct circuit, which caused it to be burned out, leaving no trace of it ever existing. Earth. Tarkon was waiting patiently in his throne room when he was alerted that a certain transmission was being received. He smiled as the data appeared on his monitor. Oh yes. These two will do nicely. He then signaled to the Earth Pixies to begin phase two of his plan. At the same time, he began the awakening process for his Tekumen. Saber. Lance. Axe. Rapier. Come to me. Your master commands you. We are here. Master. Saber said with a slight bit of irritation, 
Hetty and the other techmen appeared before the Raider Morlord. The four space warriors were in their human forms. For the most part, they had recovered from their bout with Slade and the three former Dread Pilots, but one could tell that the battles had left their marks. Raider now wore her hair like Dwaros, which covered the right side of her face. Underneath those dresses, her face was disfigured from the wounds she had received from Jura. Since then, she had vowed to make that blonde Tecumon pay. Hax had several scars crisscrossing across his own body after being on the receiving end of Mia's Volticker. He too was anxious to encounter the Nirvana's defenders and make Diamond suffer each and every wound he had suffered, a thousandfold. As for a lance, though he had suffered some damage, the biggest injury had been to his ego. He couldn't believe that a novice like Sapphire had gotten the best of him. When Saber had taunted him about it, Lance became even more determined to show him and everyone else that he was not to be taken lightly. For Saber, he was still angered that Darkon still would not give him the secret of evolving to the penultimate form. However, he was still bound to the Raider Morlord, just as the others were. He had no choice but to follow his orders or face annihilation. Perkon had ensured of their loyalty from the moment they had been created. For each contained a certain parasitic organism embedded within their medulla oblongata, which used hypnotic and painful incentives to remind them who was the master and who was the slave. Even the harvesters had been unaware of the machinations of the Raidum and their obedience chips would have been overridden, but that was a moot point. Perkon nodded to his operatives as he waved his hand. A holographic projection appeared before them, showing the nears on his present coordinates. The pirates are nearing their home systems and we cannot allow them to reach Majli and Tarek before our forces, Perkon said. Therefore, I am sending several battle groups of spider crabs to delay them until phase two of my plan is complete. How may we serve you, Lord Perkon? Lance asked with an eagerness that made Saber feel the need to hurl. Bootlicker. Asked hissing little toad. The warlord wanted to a section of space in which the Nirvana was heading toward. The pirates are heading toward this asteroid field, which happens to be near twin red stars. The solar flares and electromagnetic fields are intense and will cause massive interference with their navigational and sensor systems. I believe this will provide us with the optimum setting to obtain our guinea pigs. Master? A question? Yes, right dear. The female Tecumon gestured to the files that had been downloaded from the Nirvana's personnel database. I can see how we can get this person, but the other is most likely to remain on the Nirvana. How are we to draw him out? Excellent question, Ray Deer. Perkon commented as he then changed the images and showed them his answer. We simply use the appropriate bait. All four warriors were quite surprised to see a certain someone on the monitor. Saber exclaimed as he recognized the individual. I would have thought he'd be long dead by now. That's what I thought too, when I had the entire Harvester fleet transformed into the new Raidum Armada, but apparently, he managed to survive, though not totally intact. 
I've been keeping him under wraps until I decided how to dispose of him. In the most painful way possible, of course. Why did you not submit him to? Axe began. He would not have survived. Tarkon said, answering his incomplete question. Especially in the condition that I found him in however, his mind, though partially gone, still offered some possibilities. You say that you intend to use him as bait. Saber interrupted. As I believe, the people on the Nirzvan were not very fond of him and he made several other planets. Angry. And I also recall that the Harvesters had abandoned him as well. Tarkon agreed. However, he is still a human being. More or less and I know that the Nirzvan will answer the call of anyone in distress. You've already proven that, Saber. It is, after all, the humane thing to do. In any case, he will provide enough cause for them to at least investigate and he is considered expendable. As soon as our objective is achieved, I don't really care what happens to him afterwards. Later. Saber nodded as he read the Nears on his files concerning Slade. They were quite informative as the Tekamon began to get more insight on his greatest opponent. The personal records were specially helpful as Saber discovered a few traits about Slade, which he could use to his advantage. Ever since his creation, Saber had developed a kind of obsession with the White Tekamon. The Red Cosmic Warrior had been created for the sole purpose of destroying Slade. The fact that he had been unable to do that yet, has been a source of great irritation. Saber wanted the title of Greatest Warrior and Slade was his biggest obstacle to achieve it. The Harvester Council had never given him the fear and respect he deserved, and even his true master Darkon, considered him as nothing less than a lackey. Now that Slade had achieved the penultimate state of the Tekamon, it seemed that Saber would never be able to overcome him. However, with this new information, Saber now had a weapon in which he could use against his opponent and bring him down to his level. Psychological warfare was not his specialty, but this new tactic just might be enough. Deep in the bowels of what was once Earth, a lone figure lay in a stasis tube. He was barely alive by human standards, and his overall form was a ruin. Then again, what could one expect from someone who had been harvested? Rabbi's body was missing both his arms and legs, one lung and part of his liver. He would have been completely dissected had the radium not taken over and transformed the harvester craft that had captured him. As a result, the process had been halted and the rest of his body had been shunted into near suspended animation. He was still alive, if one could call it that. He could see and hear everything, but could not do anything. He couldn't even speak as his vocal cords had been removed during the dissection process. All he could do was drop in and out of consciousness and stare at a never-changing environment of metal, circuits and the strange organic growths that had corrupted the Earth's ship and made it an instrument of the radium. As for his simian partner Yutan, since she was not human, the harvester craft had considered her as worthless and it had ejected her into the cold, airless vacuum of space. Rabbi could only watch helplessly as the orangutan's body contorted and imploded. 
The only solace he could find was that she didn't suffer for long. She was the lucky one. As for him, his seemingly endless torment continued. Since his internment in his living tomb, Rabbi had learned from a nearby consul that the harvesters were no more and the Ragam had been resurrected. He didn't know why he was being fed such information, but figured that the new master subvert were merely torturing him for their amusement. Over time, he began to finally see the pain and suffering he had caused to those other planets and wished many times that the Radom would just kill him and get it over with. However, his silent prayers continued to go unanswered as Darkon saw fit to continue putting him in agony after agony. His limbless body was connected to several organic tendrils which allowed the Warlord to activate any number of Rabbi's remaining nerves, especially his pain receptors. Darkon found it very amusing to watch his helpless captive rise in anguish as he experienced pain that was barely endurable. Rabbi wanted to die. He wanted to die badly. There was nothing that could be worse than death. Just why didn't those random bastards end it already? What more could they want from him? It was then that he noticed a new tendril being extended toward him. Looking out of the corner of his right eye, Rabbi trembled as he saw something crawling down the tendril toward the back of his neck. The thing was about the size of a large cockroach, but possessed wicked-looking mandibles and claws. His breathing increased as he tried to squirm away from it, but the other tendrils held him fast. The creature's jaws dripped with gooey saliva and its beady eyes focused on its target. Within a minute, it had crossed the distance between them and began biting into his flesh. With his vocal cords gone, Rabbi couldn't scream out, at least not verbally. However, his mind was letting off mental screams that would have woken the dead as the radom parasite continued to gnaw its way into his neck and clamped onto a certain bundle of brainstem nerves. It embedded itself deep within his flesh as the former harvester agent lost the last bit of his own being to the radom. A few days later, Captain, I'm receiving a distress signal coming from a nearby sector of the asteroid field, Misty declared as she worked at her station. The old woman replied as she looked at the main view screen, which indicated the position of the transmission. Any idea who is hiring us? One moment, Misty said as she read the identification code. I've got it. It's someone by the name of... Rabbi? The rest of the bridge crew blanched at the mention of that name. Even Bart made his reaction known as his navigation well glowed with an angry aura. Understandably, since she had never met him, Misty couldn't comprehend their reactions. The conference room. Rabbi? A piece of space trash. What does he want? Jura snorted, as she and the others discussed their reactions to the mercenary's request for aid. Apparently, he seems to be in need of our help. Magno answered, as she waited for the inevitable response. More than a few people harbored a grudge against the traitor to the human race our help. After he sold us all out to the harvesters, I say we let him rot. Jura said emphatically, which made many of the others not in agreement. Even the cool and collected Mia had to concur with her cohort. 
Captain, you aren't really considering coming to his aid, are you? I mean, this could all be another harvester trap. Keep in mind, Mia, that the harvesters are no longer an issue. PC interjected. According to all available data, the harvesters are gone. Well, even if they are gone, that still does not excuse him for his deals with the Earth, and all those planets that had been destroyed because of them. Magno nodded. However, his distress signal appears to be genuine and he also claims to have some vital information about this new enemy, the Raven, which he is willing to share with us. How much? Slade asked with suspicion. As far as I can tell, it's free. He hasn't asked for anything. Yet. Magno answered with a shrug of her shoulders. This took everyone completely by surprise. The mere notion of Rabbi offering something without charge was absolutely ludicrous. No way. Barnett said in denial. Nothing's ever free, especially when it comes from that sneak. There has to be a catch. Duero nodded. I'm inclined to agree with Barnett on this matter. Judging from our previous encounters with Rabbi, I find it very difficult to believe that Rabbi would offer such important information without wanting something in return. In my personal opinion, he must have an ulterior motive in mind. Barnett smiled a bit when the doctor agreed with her and there was a slight tinge of red on her cheeks. Not longing to be outdone, Parfait also put in her two cents. Yeah, and you do remember when he gave us that bootleg piece of junk of a power coupling. It took my team's three days to get the engines back online. So are you suggesting that we should ignore his pleas for help? Magno asked of her crew, then directed her gaze to Duero. Will you ignore your oath as a physician? According to Rabbi's message, he has been critically injured and requires medical attention. Duero was taken aback, then sighed as he shook his head reluctantly. As a doctor, it is not my place to pass judgment. You asked for us to give our opinions. However, I will carry out my duty, regardless of any personal feelings. The decision is yours, Captain. Satisfied with his response, she then turned back to the others. And what of all of you? Are you going to just let someone die? Or we know better than Rabbi? There was a long silence as the others considered the thought of abandoning that mercenary to his fate. He most certainly deserved it. It would be so easy to simply ignore the distress signal and continue on their way to Majli and Tarek. However, their consciences just wouldn't leave them alone. Finally, Slade decided to speak. Captain, we may just regret doing this, but I suppose nobody deserves to die like that. But you have to admit that the last time we answered a distress call, it turned out to be a trap, and we were almost blown to pieces. This could be another setup. I have considered the possibility. The pirate captain admitted. Therefore, I have decided to leave this decision to a vote. All those in favor of answering Rabbi's call, raise your hands. At first, no one responded. But after a long silence, Slade was first to raise his hand as he let off a tired sigh. He hated Rabbi and wanted nothing more to do with him. 
However, it was in the code of the martial artist to help others, despite what crimes they had committed. He was immediately followed by Duero, Mia, Jura, Dida and Bart. Another moment later, the others followed, with BC being the last to agree. They all began making some contingency plans in case this rescue was a trap. Saber nodded as he watched from within a hidden seed ship in the asteroid field. On his monitor, the Nirvana began making some course changes toward Rabbi's position. Beside him, the other Tekkenen also watched with interest. HMMM, so they've taken the bait. Lance remarked. Saber snorted with disdain. HMPF. Such weakness. Actually going out of their way to save a worthless scumbag like Rabbi. They're too soft. What does it matter? Ray Deer said. Everything is going according to Lord Tarkon's plans. Now all we have to do is wait until our two test subjects appear. The Nirvana slowly made its way through the dangerous masses of rock, ice and various space debris, as it homed in on Rabbi's supposed distress signal. Two squadrons of dreads and a few Tekka suits led the way. The dreads provided cover for the smaller versions of the vanguards as they were more sweet to maneuvering about the dangerous obstacles. Among the warrior squadron, Duero was also present as he flew in his own modified Tekka suit. Unlike the others, it was equipped with more sensor arrays and medical paraphernalia. It was only armed with a light quantum energy sidearm and small, shoulder-mounted missile launchers. Flying nearby was Slade, Pegasus, and Bascogne's delivery ship. Mia, Dida and Jura were standing by in the Nirvana, along with Parfait's latest addition to their arsenal. They would be the backup, if things turned out badly. Despite the protests of both the captain and Parfait, the Tarot Doctor insisted that he be part of the away team, as Rabbi did state in his message that he needed medical attention. The captain was reluctant to let her top physician and surgeon be in danger again, regardless of the assurances that Pylai would be able to take over if something happened. As for Perfect, she made extra certain that his Tekka suit would give him the maximum amount of protection. He had turned down using the Vanguard as he surmised that he might need more fine manipulation and work in limited spaces. Barnett, however, was more than happy to be flying cover for Duero as she maneuvered her fighter as close as she could to his position. Her sensors were sweeping the areas around her for any sign of the enemy. It was then that her sensors picked up something that was nearby. The rest of the squadron also registered the object on their sensors, which they all confirmed as the energy signature of Rabbi's vessel. Duero and the other members of the warrior squadron lead the way, but as they neared the ship, the energy fields of interference grew more intense and communications became garbled. The Nirvana. Duero. Are you still there? Your communications link is beginning to break up. PC called out. Amidst the static, the good doctor answered. I'm trying. Scork. To boost my... BZZZD. Smithian. Crackle. All right. Tag visuals with. Snap. And beginning survey. Keep in contact. PHSSST.
Stand by. Hezra kept a close eye on her console, and especially on the homing beacons of the Tekka suits. Duero was suspicious as he gazed upon Rabbi's ship. It was a mess and there were several hull breaches. Energy pulses were being randomly emitted from various areas, which could explain the interference, but things didn't seem right. The damage did not seem recent and the physician was wondering how Rabbi could have fared for very long with the ship in this state. He then put to the test, Parfait's sensor enhancements to his Tekka suit. Cutting through the electromagnetic pulses and other energy emissions, he began picking up faint human life signs but the signals were barely detectable. They were just hovering above a comatose state. Using his quantum energy side M, he began cutting into the hull near one of the holes, which was located close to the bridge. When the opening was wide enough, he gave a few hand signals to Slate and the others indicating for them to hold back and prepare for anything. He then entered the ship and came across his patient. Duero to Nirvana. I found him. So that's why his life signs are so low. The doctor thought as he saw the former mercenary encased within a strange looking cryostasis pod. His body was definitely in need of medical attention and he seemed to be in a kind of trance-like state. This got Duero to thinking as he approached the pot and began examining it. HMMM. It looks like he's been in near suspended animation for three months. He took note of the biochronology readings of his sensors. That doesn't make any sense. If he was in stasis for that long, then how did he transmit that distress signal? It wasn't more than a few hours old. And if I'm reading my med scanners right, then he shouldn't have been able to speak, let alone transmit an audio message. He's missing his larynx and... Wait a minute. What is that thing? His Tekka suit's biomed scanners began focusing on a certain structure that was implanted at the base of Rabbi's medullar oblongata. It was putting out its own life signs, which were attuned to Rabbi's. They were synchronized so closely that Duero's sensors could barely distinguish one from the other. I have no idea what that thing is, but I'm willing to bet that it has something to do with the Raven. And if that's the case, then this entire setup may just well be a... It was at that moment, the Raven parasite sprung the trap. Using Rabbi's nervous system as a conductor, it transmitted an electromagnetic pulse which activated certain devices within the pod. Tendrils of pseudocytoplasm shot out from the pod and wrapped themselves around Puero's Tekka suit. The physician had no chance to defend himself as the tendrils pierced through the reinforced alloys and began playing havoc with the circuitry. The turret man found himself trapped within an armored straight jacket as all of his systems, save for a life support, were deactivated. At that moment, the others found themselves under attack. Captain, I've lost contact with the doctor's homing beacon. Ezra cried out. Just as she spoke, the entire ship shuddered from a massive barrage, putting the entire crew on bat alert. From within hidden pockets in the nearby asteroids, swarms of spider crabs emerged to assault Magno's crew. Among them were four agents of Parkon. 
in the main hangar of the Nirvana, Tina, Chura and Mia were given the go signal. Each climbed aboard her new fighter and powered up its engines. The new mini dreads his perf had referred them as, were fully armed and fueled. The hangar doors opened up and they were systematically launched. Each fighter was about the size of an old-style Earth F-86 Sabre jet, and was similarly designed as its former, larger incarnation. Each emphasized the best traits of the pilot. Mia's was of course, sleek and designed for speed. Being smaller meant that it presented less target space and offered greater maneuverability. Chures offered high protection as well as a wide cone of fire with its eight quantum cannons, mounted in quads on each side. Titus was a combination of the others, with even balance of speed, armor and firepower. Each girl felt as if she back in the Dread Squadrons again as her new fighter easily made short work of her spider crab adversaries. With Pixie's power coursing through each machine's circuits, the three Tekkenen began decimating the hordes of Darkon. Mia made a tight banking maneuver and led four spider crabs on a merry chase through the asteroids. Two of them were unable to negotiate the tight spaces and fields of debris. They ended up crashing into the chunks of rock and exploding into pus and organic debris. She then put her mini dread into a reverse loop, putting herself behind her remaining two pursuers. With a couple of quick bursts from her forward quantum blasters, she picked them off like a skeet shooter taking out clay targets. Jura absolutely loved her new weapon as she activated its reflector satellites. Each device was circular in shape and rotated about her fighter like her original dread. With a special coating of Pixie's crystals on each, the satellites easily reflected every shot made against her and when she used them to reflect the blasts of her own cannons, it caught the groups of Raven drones off guard, devastating their numbers and causing confusion among their ranks. As for Dinah, it was as if she was saying hello to an old friend. Though she was still a novice pilot as compared to her comrades, but with her new Pixies powered mini dread, she was able to take out several dozens of spider crabs. It was like playing a video game. Zap! 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 5,000 points. With this new turn of events, the dreads and Tekka suits were given a reprieve as the pressure was eased off. Barnett took this opportunity to check on Duero and headed toward Rabbi's ship. What she didn't know was that she was playing right into Darkon's hands. The actions of the new weapons caught the attention of three of the Raider Morlord's minions and they began making a beeline toward them. The three dread pilots caught sight of them and took evasive action. However, each girl knew that their opponents had the advantage in maneuverability, power and armor. So that only left them with one recourse. Each girl pressed a switch on their consoles, which made a small panel open before them. Her tech A crystal was raised up in a slot. Perfect had created the many dreads by using their crystals as focal points for their Pixies energy systems. They grasped their most precious possessions and, in a flash, their canopies opened up and the girls became their more powerful alter egos. The many dreads flew off to one side as Sapphire, Diamond and Ruby took on Lance 
Axe and rapier. Meanwhile, Slade gritted his teeth as grappled with Saber. Pegasus was unable to come to his aid as it was busy with several spider crabs. The two rivals exchanged blow after brutal blow as the battle raged on. The white Tecumon found himself being pushed harder and harder, as his scarlet foe continued his relentless assault. What's the matter, Slade? Saber taunted as he landed a savage kick to Slade's head. You're not putting up much of a fight. Have you been letting yourself slide? Shut up. Slade growled as he countered with a fast diagonal slash with his lance. However, Saber being experienced with Slade's usual tactics, carried with his own weapon, then sent a fist into Slade's abdomen, driving him back. Not this time, Slade. You think I haven't learned from all of our past encounters? He emphasized his point by slashing his lance across Slade's chest armor, followed by a triple punch and kick combination, making his opponent reel back even further. He let off another chuckle. In a way, I can't help but feel that we're two of a kind, Slade. Like brothers, opposite sides of the mirror. We both strive to be the best, but there's only room in this universe for one ultimate warrior. And the way I see it, my closest rival is about to relinquish his claim to the title. That is, unless you intend to cheat by evolving into your stronger form. Slade gritted as he gripped his lance even tighter. Saber chuckled again. You know, now that I think about it, you've never actually won against me in a one-on-one -on -one fight, have you? You've always had some sort of last-minute rescue or secret weapon to use against me. Now you've got this almighty transformation. If you are truly deserving of the mantle of a Tecumon, then you should be able to beat me. Without resorting to it. Why? You. I read your files, Slade. You are quite adamant as a martial artist, aren't you? And you've got considerable amounts of... What was it called? Oh yes. Inner. Saber said that last part with complete contempt, making Slade's blood boil even more. So what are you saying? Slade snarled. What I'm saying that I've already proven that I'm the better warrior. Unless you wish to prove that I'm wrong. How about it, Slade? We can settle this once and for all. No Techabot. No transformations, no spider crabs, no one to help either of us. There is no raid of more near Zana. It's just between you and me, Slade. Tecumon against Tecumon. A fight to the finish. Is this another one of your master's plans? Slade said suspiciously. Darkon has nothing to do with this. Now then, are you going to fight me? With honor? Or are you going to be a coward and hide behind that evolved form of yours? Slade growled and prepared to go at it again. His adrenaline level were reaching its peak, and Saber's taunts were pushing just the right buttons to make him become reckless. It seemed that some parts of Ranma showed him his former self, were still buried deep within him. Now those traits were emerging as he charged. The Nirvana. HMMM. What is Slade doing? Magno asked as she watched the battle between the two rivals. I've never seen him like this before. PC remarked as she also watched the fight. 
It's almost as if he's fighting as an entirely different person. Yes, that may be the case. What do you mean? I've been suspecting that Slade's lost past may be gradually returning. Remember that D boy has never been able to talk about his past, since he couldn't recall any details about it before becoming a Tekamon. Now I've been noticing that his behavior has become more, shall we say, cruder, and that's starting to make him more reckless. Are you saying that this lack of control is because it was a part of his former self? Possibly. Let's just hope that this won't affect his better judgment. Interesting toys. Lance commented as he observed the many dreads, while taking on Dida. The new fighters were capable of remote-controlled flight by their pilots and were giving covering fire for the other dread pilots. The three girls were currently engaging against their comms minions. Yes, but they were nothing more but toys. Rapier added as she caught Jura's sword in a bind with her own. And mere toys mean nothing against the United States. Ax emphasized as he forced me backward with his weapon. You were lucky the last couple of times, and now it's payback. Jura, Mia and Dida found themselves in a tight spot as their opponents continued their ruthless assaults.